Welcome to the podcast. The only podcast is dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I almost entered on the other podcast to do the successful off the athletes podcast. Forgive me. Uh, this one is presented by Trainer Road, like all of them, and we are joined by an awesome crew. We have our uh, we have a Trainer Road in Cannondale's Amber Pierce. Good morning. <laughs> we, we have uh, Cliff Bar Racing's and also Trainer Road's Pete Morris. How's it going, guys? And our CEO Nate Pearson. Hello. We have is, breaking news, John. Breaking news. And I wish Chad was do. here. But uh, straight out of Cape Town, South Africa, they have pushed Cape Epic to October. <clears throat> and uh, what happened is they listened to our podcast and heard about Chad's ankle. <clears throat> said, Thunny and Hunter needs a lot more time <laughs> to train. So they pushed it out to October. Um, that's actually really good, though, because obviously it's COVID related. But Sophia, inside baseball, behind the scenes stuff here. Sophia was had a Pan Am's game conflict, and she was using that to qualify for the Olympics. So there was a very strong chance that I was I didn't have a teammate, and I was going to find one. Uh, <laughs> so I had some uh, good ones in mind, but now I think it should be great because this will be post Olympics for Sophia, and uh, this is like a more fun event. She has to be super duper fit for it. And I'll, I'll have a super screaming fast teammate because she just will hopefully if she qualifies have been at the Olympics. And then Amber, that gives us two better time to like get better skills, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> make really good use of that extra time. <laughs> Pete, were you ready fitness wise for March? A March eight day, twelve yeah. hours a day race. I was I was trying really hard. It was definitely my A event for the year, so I was trying to put in the right amount of work to get us there. And then Chad's ankle was not putting in the same amount of work that I was. I don't think. <laughs> Do you really need to put in that much work though, if you're Chad's partner? <clears throat> oh, oh, every time oh, I listen to this thing, oh, you guys talk uh, about me. So we do. This is just we facts, do. though, right? <laughs> it's not. It's oh, not talking Chad. poo poo. Uh, we'll see. I I think Chad's Chad's uh, Chad's mountain bike skills are way better than I think everybody realizes, um, and his fitness is about the same as it usually is. So hopefully, we can get his fitness uh, up. And I, I'm not worried about the technical stuff. I think he's going to have fun. And we seem to still like each other at the end of our multiple hour mountain bike rides. So that's something. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's, you guys have been doing like long rides together, which is kind of cool. Uh, and he's been not cramping. Another So a couple key things to think about, too, because it's in October in South, uh, South Africa is in the summit hem southern hemisphere. This will be their spring. So for those who don't mountain bike, in places where it's a uh, dry summer, like Reno, like Cape Town, uh, springtime, the dirt is way better and totally different than the fall. The amount of technicality that loose over hard, John, tell, describe to people. What, what is that? Yeah. Like if you had like a snickerdoodle cookie and you left it out for a week and then you put it on a table and then you tried to ride your bike on like a whole table of snickerdoodle cookies, that's what it's like riding in the fall. So, But in the terrifying. spring, it's like velcro right or like, kind of like the road if it's hard packed it, it's like fresh oatmeal cookies it's different to, <laughs> to stick with the cookie side of things yeah yeah yeah, yeah. great traction i've never ridden on an oatmeal cookie but i assume it'd have great traction so <laughs> and the high temp is only gonna so anyways for us that have worse technical skill that's going to be good for us but each team for has sure. someone who's not the best technically and then uh the heat the average high the average range in october is 58 to 74 degrees. I don't know what that is in Celsius, but that's it's a cool day where you can start off. Maybe you have a vest when you line up and then you take it off, but you can mountain biking. You can totally do the whole ride without anything cool, but you're, it's also not going to be hundred degrees like it what could be in March. Um, that's advantage you Pete, like, cause Chad's always yeah. done pretty poorly in super hot conditions. This, these will be mild. Yeah. And that's, yes. that's something that you actually enjoy riding in all day, right? Like mm -hmm. you don't yeah. overheat and hang out for two hours and a hundred degrees and barely pull yourself back together and then lay on the couch when you get done with the ride for three hours. <laughs> Hopefully Chad we're... will. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say that's about 16, 17 degrees C for, for, for folks listening over the pond. It, I would say that range for mountain biking is like ideal because mountain biking, mm -hmm. you always, uh, you can go a little bit colder cause you're not going as fast. Uh, mm -hmm. we're road riding in like the fifties, you start to like want a vest, but it, when you're going like 12 miles per hour, it can feel really good at, in the high fifties anyways. Uh, so that's the, that's the update, more drama for longer, uh, and hopefully it will happen <laughs> with vaccines and all that kind of stuff. Sure. We're, I think we're going to be able to stretch this, this out. 
Yeah, <laughs> everybody's just really happy listening to this because we get more uh, Cape Epic hype uh, for well, the whole so year. So much smack talk. It is. We got to sign up on. for the 2021 rematch because everyone's going to want to try to beat Sophia and I after we win Ooh. in October. <laughs> oh, look at this mm-hmm. already. Oh man. <laughs> Another very crucial update that we have to share. This one's perhaps not so crucial, but uh, we now have learned. It's funny because I've seen headlines where they say like Mount Everest uh, changed its elevation, which I mean, technically it's always changing its elevation. But anyways, it's now officially three feet higher. So all these people planning these Everesting attempts, if you you climbed like to the money, then <laughs> that's very sad because you have to restart. I have had many concerned podcast listeners reaching out to me telling me I have to do it again. Uh, podcast listeners, don't worry about it. I made so many mistakes. Did Nate, you're, you got a you got a face going on. Wait, well, you Everested? <laughs> I know. Sorry, Believe I, it or I not, I did not say that. But yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should cover it sometime. Yeah, I, been, I never, I never knew about this. Did you, is it like the classic style Everest? You know, we have like ten questions to cover today, but let's just talk about this instead. This would be better. Um, no, so so this, I, this is a good check. point. I say it's ever seen based on the the height of Everest on that date, because yeah. a thousand years from now it's going to be even higher, and we're not yeah. going to go back and clear the records. Exactly, John. You, can't you do have that. this for eternity. Oh yeah. Well, we have it anyway because we made very. Uh, you know, we got into that weird. You don't make a lot of sense on a bike after like three hours of riding hard, but then when you do like 26 hours, nothing makes sense. And we trusted our Garmin's in the midst of a storm. And they were telling us that we were at like 20,000 feet instead of we were actually at 29,000 feet. So we climbed a lot of extra. We're good. In like 2000 <laughs> years when Everest is like super high, we're still good. I think so. <laughs> it's like we're if dialed. you were to like cross the ocean or you swim across Lake Tahoe. But then next year, Lake Tahoe's water level is higher. Therefore, the distance is longer. We don't, we're like, you never did it. Yeah, you did it. Like, <laughs> exactly. D- you did it. <laughs> exactly. So uh, thank you very much, Concerned Podcast listeners. But we're, I'm okay. And even if it did invalidate my result, I'm okay. Because we never even had a result. So, um, <clears throat> okay. And with this as well, something that you should absolutely listen to if you're listening to this podcast is the Successful Athletes Podcast. There's a link down below. Subscribe to it. Last week, we talked to Jamie Berry. He was an athlete who was struggling with REDS, um, so uh, basically an energy deficiency syndrome where he got to the point where he was very worn down. And this is like, we're talking severe. We're talking blood tests that show that his testosterone markers were so, so low that they were, I mean, listen to it. It's crazy. Uh, he used trainer road to come back and now he's hitting PRs faster than he has weighs more than he did before eats way more carbs than he did feels better on the bike feels better in life. We're going to talk about carbs more in this episode. Like we uh, do surprise, surprise. But, <laughs> yep. Um, and then next week's episode is going to be with Laura Alanya out of Chicago. She used trainer road to cat up from cat four, all the way to cat two in cyclocross. And we talk all about the process that she did being an adult onset cyclist And just going in the last, really, it's like five or six years of her going from, oh, I guess I did ride a bike when I was a kid. I can do this again to being now a cat too, which is really cool. And, and like a a good, strong racer. So, and that's probably one of the more like takeaway rich episodes we've done where she like shares, this is what I did to be really good at this, this, and this, and this is what I did that was really functional in cat three, but now in cat two, it's different. And this is what I'm doing. It's really cool. So it's a great episode and everybody should check it out. Um, and then, uh, we also should mention the fact that Nate, uh, you have a, a, a business podcast of sorts that, that you've been uh, testing out. Well, uh, it <laughs> I doesn't have, the have best a name business yet. podcast in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. And also I don't, I, I struggle to call it a podcast cause it is in some respects, but it's video. It's a sh- well. I call it a business so. show at the moment. Uh, we go. interview business leaders and we ask questions about that other people have about work kind of same thing as this, except the, uh, the co-hosts are rotating through because I think we can learn from all these people. There's no like a uh, pattern or no, there's no book that describes how to do this. And we've done two episodes they are on my Instagram, tr.nate. I'm going to do one more episode and then we're going to launch it as a, a podcast and I'll put it on YouTube and stuff too, to make it easier to listen to. I understand IG TV is not the easiest way to listen to it. Uh, but if you get like, you shoot up the chart charts more, if you have some episodes first, so people can download multiple. So when you do subscribe, please download them all. And, um, maybe that can get the reach a little bit farther. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll decide on the name and I'm pretty sure, but I don't know. I gotta think about it more. Along those lines too, if you're listening to this podcast, you can subscribe and you can auto download the episodes. So then you don't miss them. 
Um, and then when you do that sort of a thing, that also helps because then iTunes says, Ooh, more people subscribing. I'm going to give this to more people when they're searching for cycling content. So, uh, that helps us a ton because then more people hear this, more people get faster. It's uh, all good. Do we want to cover point four in our doc or do we want to yeah, move sure. on to point six? Okay. Go Let's ahead. Do four. Okay. So, uh, I said something last week and in the forum, people were like, blah, blah, blah. Nate is wrong about this <laughs> once again. And I think what it is, is I did not do a very good job of explaining it. Okay. So what I talked about is the relationship of workouts in a finite period and how the likelihood that it changes to be able to do another workout. And let me, I'll just, I'll explain it better this time. So in, and this is to, I'll, I'll just, this supposed to be a long explanation. Okay. So what we did is we look at different difficulties of workouts in different energy systems. And so if you do one workout in one energy system within the next two weeks, how likely is it that you can do harder workouts in other energy systems in there? And I'm not talking about long-term months of Z2 that then, um, uh, establishes like increases your FTP. What I'm talking about is what we see is if you do a hard FTP workout, you are a uh, threshold workout, you are more likely to be able to accomplish a, uh, hard VO two max anaerobic sweet spot all the way down to endurance. But if you do a hard endurance workout, you are more likely to do a harder tempo workout, but not a harder threshold of VO two max. And if you think about this in the near term, this is in a two week period, remember, uh, that if you do a bunch of zone two, are you really going to ch change your power at VO two max inside of that, that period? But if you uh, if, two week uh, period, that, that two week period, it takes a long time to get aerobic adaptations through Z two. And we know this, and I'm not this, this, what I'm saying does not conflict with that one bit. These are two different things. Um, there's what I'm talking about has, I think a lot of use. We also have a, um, just saying way too much, but an ML project too, that shows that when you do more volume, more Z2 increases your FTP. Like th that's, that this is over long terms, bigger chunks of time. So nothing that I said there means that that is not still true. This is just in a mm -hmm. finite time period, which I think is one of the most interesting things. Cause we can actually measure what the, how much better you can do in each one. And I, I mean, someone on the forum, I, it's, I love it that constructive be on the forum, but somebody said that's useless information. And I was like, this is like, I think it's the coolest information I've ever seen in our, <laughs> our data set. So there's definitely a disconnect between our opinions, but hopefully I can prove, or we can also, prove gang. One thing, Nate, that future, I want to say two product <clears throat> managers here. Yeah. You just said uh, the word opinion, and I just want to make sure something is understood. These are not your opinions that you're talking about, but these are observations from the data set. And that, yeah, that's my, an important thing to make. It's not that, um, it's not that Nate has an opinion and he's seeking to validate that with the data set. It's just, these are the observations that we've seen yeah. with the data set. And we're just sharing those observations. Someone so that's, that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. Someone had a hypothesis and they went through, I didn't even thought they just want to see if there was one. And then they showed this and I was like, Whoa, that's cool. Uh, and the opinion part was just how useful you think it is. The mm -hmm. other thing I want to say is whenever you look at data sets like this, what you can get are like, uh, I forget the correct word, but basically the data set is biased. So let's say we never had someone who would do a hard endurance ride and then try to do a hard threshold of VO2 max. And what people, um, I've seen people say this too, is like, Hey, you're because you guys have plans, your data set will match your plans very closely. But we honestly, we have tens of millions of rides that are not in plans. Like, and we can look at those separately and stuff too. These are self-selected. Um, and then you can look at too, is if somebody, uh, does not pass a workout, like they struggle with it versus they do. So if you can find people that have attempted the hard workout, they do this, the hard Z2 and they attempt a hard VO2 max or threshold, but then they can't do it. That makes you more confident that that, uh, relationship, or there's not a strong relationship there. We're on the other side of for VO2 max and threshold, if they try it and they pass it, that's, that's how you can get more confident in that data set. But we are totally aware that, uh, you don't want, you don't want to just prove what you prescribe to people, right? Cause that, sure. that is, that could totally happen. Uh, yeah. anyways, that's a long explanation. And, uh, I think this is like my favorite part of work right now is this sort of stuff. Um, yeah. Anyways. There's, there's, there's something interesting to share with this too. Uh, if, in fact, Amber and I were just talking about this before the podcast started, but, uh, 
we're adhered to science-based principle leading the way and taking oh. a principled approach to it and having science lead the way. So like if we saw with data that, that things were better in a, in a totally different direction, let's say that we all found out that riding at 250% FTP and doing that for, you know, as much time as you could broken up into short shorts, that's how you get faster. If there was enough data to prove that, then we would want to start testing that. And then we would want to then see where that goes. So like we, we just are adhered to the whole concept of science leading the way and helping get people faster. That's it. This, this so is, uh, not instead well, of just like pushing our wares, which is uh, it's a fun thing to do because then that way we get to sit back and then we get to like really find the best way rather than adhering ourselves to a specific methodology or dogma that exists. So it's cool. This is, this is one of the other things that grinds, like if you want to poke me on the internet, there's a few things <laughs> and this is one of them is you say that like, for some reason I'm in love with sweet spot periodization or something like that. You know how much more money we could make if we could prove that there is a better trading system and then everyone goes to it. I don't think everyone's going to be like, Oh, like they're not going to be upset with us. They're going to be so happy, right? That we do right. that. And if we, yeah. uh, if we, and it's not just in a six week thing, we're looking at many, many months, right? Like how to make someone better over a season in years, not in a six week mm -hmm. time frame, Cause those are two different things. If we just, mm -hmm. if everyone just want to be fit for two, two, six weeks, we would throw so much VO2 max at you. Like it would be insane. Yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> but the, but just in general, like our, our interests are aligned. If we make you faster. We grow as more as a company. We accomplish our mission. The whole world gets faster, which has all of these implications. And I don't think we look poorly at all by changing and updating our stuff. Uh, yeah. So just that's, I don't, I don't personally care like any about any of that. <laughs> yeah. It's constant. We're adhered to constant improvement in science. So that that's growth mindset folks. Us. Yeah. That's growth it. Mindset. <clears throat> we, we think the same as you, uh, we want to get faster too. So, um, Nate, we need to cover something. Speaking of getting faster, mm -hmm. and for, in my case, not getting faster, your case, yes, getting faster. I recently took a RAM test and I wanted to share the results of this because I think that a lot of the time when we look at other people training, we just assume that everybody else has an ideal training experience, but then we don't, and we're the only ones. It's easy to feel that way. And I know that sounds ridiculous right now if you're hearing that from an externalized perspective, but if you internalize for a bit or that for a bit, you probably have this perspective going on quite often. That's normal for us. Um, so I was, so I, I finished off my year and I was at 315 and my workouts were feeling pretty easy at 315 for my FTP. And then, uh, I took an intentional two weeks off that stretched to another week because of landscaping projects. And then I had three weeks where I was sick. Uh, thank goodness it was not COVID. Um, but I was still very sick. And so that ended up, if you look at that, then two weeks then stretched to a huge time period. And I was like, eh, maybe I could just come back in at three Oh five, you know, like I dropped it down and did the same thing that every one of us cyclists has thought like, I can just manually drop it down and I'll see where I go. And I thought about that and I was like, this is the wrong approach. Like the whole point of the ramp test is to get accurate training. It isn't to pad my ego. It isn't to try to shortcut my way to anything. That's, it doesn't work like that. It's not designed to work like that. Instead, it's designed to give you accurate training and accurate training is the best way to get faster because it's adjusted for you. So in my case, I took the ramp test and I went from the 315 heights all the way down to 286. And which is a, a big drop for me relative to, to you. I'm sure anybody can figure out that sort of math. So I dropped down to that. Was it frustrating? A hundred percent. Was I disappointed? A hundred percent. Did I like start to curse the fact that I had, uh, that my child always gets me sick? Of course I did. <laughs> like all of these things. But at the same time, I had to step back and look at it. And once again, remind myself, well, this is just the best way to get accurate training. And as a result, since then, my workouts have been fantastic. They've been all within the bandwidth of, of, I guess, completability, if you'll pardon that word there. But what I'm getting at is the, I wasn't dreading my workouts. I didn't feel like my workouts were bringing me down to zero every night. So then I was just fearing the next workout. I don't feel that right now. And I'm getting faster. I can already tell in the short space of two weeks. So I just wanted to share that. Don't be afraid of the ramp test. Just take the ramp test. And remember, it's not a proving of your speed. It's not a proving of your worth as an individual or an athlete, even though we way too often assimilate those. Really what it comes down to is just a good benchmark, a snapshot of your fitness at that time. But above all, it's a benchmark to anchor your training. So now Nate, you had the opposite uh, experience recently. 
Mine went up, so therefore my worth has increased as a human being. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore everything John just said. Yeah, when it's a bad result, nothing to do with it. When it's a good result, everything to do with it, right? This is because of the hard work I put in. And, uh, this is the result. Consistency and hard work. Uh, that, I, there's not too much to say, but I think if you remember, I had a really good RAM test of 372. I kind of had a, I overtrained and then I tapered and then I had that, but then I had like sickness and time off and I went down to like 330, now 340. Now I'm back at 354. Everyone who messaged me on Instagram who said, oh, it'll come back in just a couple weeks. It does not. Like, I think it's because it was uh, peak fitness for me with a taper. Um, if it were, uh, if it was some, if it was an FTP, I'd been at a lot. I think it would have came back quickly. Like if mm -hmm. I stopped training, I could get back to 3.30 pretty quickly, I think, because I've been there for a long time or above there. But mm -hmm. that brings me to uh, 4.06. And John, you're down to 4.2 watts per kilo. I'm 192 Correct. pounds, so 87 kilograms at the moment mm -hmm. on creatine because uh, I heard that it might help with concussion. And it's just uh, why not get strong when we're not going up any hills right now? And the last thing to think about, though, is what would we be at sea level, John? because you did not type that in. I didn't type that in, and this is yeah, true. And right, if you Amber. go, there we go, Amber. Uh, 400 Watts Club on Instagram, thank you for making that wonderful illustration that has Nate talking about all these things. You gotta that check it out. amazing. Uh, so uh, based on science, our FTPs at sea level are about 5% higher, and uh, that means puts me at 372 at about 4.28 Watts per kilo. And that puts me somewhere right around 300 down at sea level right now. So, um, Amber. Yeah. I just, on this topic, I was, uh, chatting on Instagram with a TR athlete about exactly this, a drop in FTP. And I think a really cool way of thinking about the ramp test is it tells you what your body needs right now. So if you haven't been able to train or you've been under a lot of stress or in the case of this athlete, we had a recent crash, your body needs to dial it back. And the ramp test will tell you that. And in Nate's case, he's been training and making gains. And so in order to keep making those gains, his body is going to need more training stress and therefore a higher intensity in his upcoming workouts. And the FTP test is going to tell you that. So it, think of it less in terms of a test and more in terms of a conversation with your body mm -hmm. to check in and figure out what your body's going to need for your upcoming block. Yeah. Whenever you great, say that, great I think way to wrap it up. Amber. Awesome. We're like Gatorade. <laughs> Sorry, there's a delay. <laughs> good reference. That yeah, we're having reference. some uh, internet uh, issues between all of mm -hmm. us somehow. So if there's a lot of delay, uh, I'm sure that the internet will get it worked out somewhere. It's a series of tubes. It'll be fine. Um, so uh, the one thing that I think we do need to mention, though, is somebody actually asked in the forum, Nate, will this new information change the way you train? And it's gonna, and that's exactly the point. Uh, we try to apply that into our products all the time to change the way we train. So all the stuff that we learn, we let that funnel into uh, changes. So, um, but we can't say anything else. So, uh, Nate already, I almost yanked Nate's cord out digitally like 10 times when he was talking to, uh, before there. So, um, we had a, sorry, before in a Watts Club talked about beers with Chad again, and it did a yes. great animation of us. I feel like beers with Chad is like Russian roulette for the company. Like we, like we've, we've yeah. dodged, like it it's is. been click, click, click so many times. Not to, that's like a, don't ever play that game, but, um, I don't know. I, it stresses me out just thinking about it. I did it once and I was like, that's enough for the rest of my life. Cause I, yeah. when I drink, especially those who've met me in public, I like to talk about three years of trainer road plans to people I've just met, um, which is, which is not very good. Nate went zero to 100 real quick with beers to, with beers of Chad. So, yeah. um, but there is a possibility that it may come back in the near future. We'll see. So stay tuned to our Instagram. Follow us at Trainer Road. Follow all of us on there too. Pete had also forgotten. Amber, Amber Malika, Nate, TR Nate, myself, Lee Jonathan. Okay. TR. Bobby's Nate. question. TR. Nate, forgive me. <clears throat> okay. Bobby says, while I have been cycling for a while, now after discovering all the wonderful content and products you folks created earlier this year. I've been inspired to start racing. This is a natural occurrence, uh, Bobby. Way to go. That's the point. He says, obviously, COVID-19 has disrupted racing in a massive way, delaying, if not outright, forcing events to cancel. And up where I live in Washington State, currently the only road-specific races that have an actually scheduled start date in 2021. Though who knows if that will stay put or not. 
our 20 our multi-day stage races. So typically four races over a three day span and include one or two road races and a Merck style time trial and a crit. This is a really common amateur format here in the United States. Uh, but I assume that other people listening to this may have different formats. We're going to talk about stage races in general, not specific to this format. He says, as a complete bike racing newbie with no real experience, and he says, with racing strategy beyond watching a bunch of your race analysis videos, which by the way, if you watch that and truly internalize that information, you're already steps ahead of people. <laughs> so Everybody. there's just so much information that you can get from those. Ooh, watch um, Markel Cycling too. Yes, another great one. If you partner those two, you're going to, you're, you, it's like a, it's like a, master's program. You're like an MBA program for cycling. So, um, <laughs> he says, uh, and he says, so I'm going to reread that section as a complete bike racing newbie with no real experience with racing strategy, other than watching your videos, riding in large packs and so on. Is it a bad idea to use a bigger event like this, a stage race as my debut to the racing world, or should I wait for some smaller events to more gradually introduce myself to racing? I'm confident that my fitness will be in a great place for whatever event I end up targeting thanks to trainer road, but I'm concerned about, I would be biting off way more than I can chew for my experience level by jumping right into a multi-day event. So do you have any advice on this? And he finishes off with saying, thanks so much. And two thumbs way, way up for all the, for all that you folks do the podcast videos and product have been such a huge help for me. And I'm sure many, many others, uh, in surviving 2020, if I could add to that too, the blog, uh, fantastic articles constantly coming out there and then our forum as well. So great community there. Okay. So I, I'm going to pitch this one to Pete first. Uh, so Pete, the core question, are stage races a bad idea for a beginner racer for their debut? I don't think there's any bad debut race. I mean, there's probably some, but Really, the idea is you want to get your feet wet as soon as you possibly can and learn as much as you can in a short period of time. Like that's what we all want out of bike racing. And a stage race means you get to dip your toes in a bunch of different pools with a bunch of other people who are dipping their toes in the same pools. And uh, you just um, that curve, that learning curve is so fast when you're racing day after day after day. So I think to me, this is ideal. If I could choose to start all my seasons with stage races or sprinkle in more stage races over the course of the season, I would always do it. Mm. It's right. Oh yeah, We're absolutely. I, it's, it's almost like, um, when you go to any sort of like accelerated learning program, or like, if it's like an offsite thing that you're doing, where it's just like super focused for a short period of time, but what that allows you to do is kind of like learn, iterate, learn it, you know, and just constantly go through that process. And yeah, it's it, honestly like your first bike race, it's not about how you finish. So I kind of, I see what you mean, Pete, about saying like, if there's not a bad first race in that regard, because it's like your result doesn't really matter. Instead, what it's about is what you learn along the way. Right. Um, Nate, what, what are your thoughts on this one? Um, Ram is a bad first race, but other than that, this is the <laughs> best way. Like yeah. if you can put them together, if you can do lots of crits on the same day, cause I, a lot of us, especially in lower categories, if you're a master's racer or they have overlapping categories, you can do multiple races the same day. That is the best way. I feel like you can know oh, I missed this move or I did this wrong, or you just get more comfortable, which is huge for new racers to be able to be comfortable in the pack. And then on the second and third race, it feels so much better. So little, uh, little stage races, like, well, this is a, this is a pretty good, awesome stage race, actually four days or four races, hundred percent, do it, do it, do it, do it. Uh, try different things like what Chad's talked about this a lot. You don't have to win. You can learn different ways that you can ride the race. What does it feel like to be in a breakaway? How's that? What does it feel like to be in the sprint? What does it feel like to tail gun? What does it feel like to try to stay at the front? There's uh, where's it was it feel like to sag climb all these skills that you learn in the videos. You're going to say, Hey, I'm going to try to apply it here and see how it works. Unless you're hopefully you have good fitness. There is the, I've been in the races where you're just, I just want to survive and not get dropped. And you can yeah. do some of those skills and stuff, but if you sag climb wrong, there's no room for error and you are gone. And then you ride by what? yourself for like 40 miles, which is yeah. <laughs> what, uh, one of our uh, great copywriters, Jesse, he mentioned, so he used to be a teacher and he mentioned something and it was a very applicable quote. He says, no matter how good the student is before vacation, they're worse after vacation. And usually what, and what he's getting at there is the fact that when you have time away from something, you're not as good as you were when you were stuck into that steady rhythm. And this is an opportunity for you to really walk into a steady rhythm and to race a bunch and to figure things out and to iterate in between races and do all that stuff. Because in the end, like you don't have to care about the GC results at all uh, at this point, right? Like 
instead focus on like the smaller wins. That's probably a, a good point to hand off to you, Amber, on this more like the actual processes or things you can do amidst the stage race to make sure that you're getting the most out of it. Cause it could just be, if you aren't taking like a growth mindset and looking for opportunities to improve and measure and that sort of stuff, it could be really overwhelming. But if instead, you know, exactly what you should be looking for, you could make it successful. Big time. Yeah. And apologies in advance. There's some noise going on in my house today. So if you hear some <laughs> background noise, yeah, we're all in the same boat these days. Um, I totally agree. And I, I think it's, uh, exactly what Pete and Nate and Jonathan you've said is I think stage races are actually just an awesome learning environment, especially as regards process goals. Um, there is a lot going on in stage races. So probably the best thing to do is to pick one or two goals that you're going to really focus on each day. And as a new rider, probably one of the most important ones, you, the two most important ones I think you could focus on are positioning, learning how to feel comfortable in the group and learning how to move through the group. Um, a good way to work on that is to shadow a, a trusted, more experienced athlete during the race. And you can even talk to them, approach them and say, Hey, I'm new. I'd really like to learn how to position better you know, like to kind of follow your wheel around for the day. Honestly, most of the time, nobody would mind. Um, the other one is hydrating and fueling well. So getting used to eating on the bike in the middle of a race when there's a lot going on, those are some really kind of basic skills that stage races are wonderful for trying because mm -hmm. the, the positioning thing, you're going to learn so much on the first day that you can then go and apply the second day. And then you're going to learn so much on the second day that you can then go and apply immediately the day after that. And it's really cool. Uh, the other thing that's neat about stage races is there's so much going on. And on one hand, this could be really overwhelming, but also you could think of it as just giving you this whole host of opportunities for learning. So there's the, the general classification, which is, you know, the, the overall winner for the whole stage race. There's also stage wins. There's also a points Jersey, probably a sprint Jersey. So intermediate intermediate point sprints. There's probably a king or queen, queen of the mountain Jersey. There's preems, um, you know, you can aim for consistency. You could look for, you could look to just see, you know, like, can you actually, while you're trying to work on your process goals, maybe read the race a little bit and figure out, you know, why is that person sprinting for points and which teams are going for GC and which teams seem to be going for stages and how are those different strategies that are going on around you affecting people's decision-making in the race. So there's just, it's, it's such a rich learning environment where you can kind of pick and choose the things that you really, really want to work on and completely ignore the rest. So if you feel that mm. the positioning is coming pretty easily to you and you want to take on some more, it's there for the taking. And if you feel like it's too much, you can totally zero down and focus on one thing and not worry about the rest. So I really, I don't see any downside to this, honestly. Uh, one, one thing that Amber said about, uh, asking someone, you know, I want to follow your wheel in the lower categories, the chance that you will find a Pete or an Amber is probably very low. And a lot of people who think that they know what they're doing, they don't always do it correctly. And then also too, Pete and Amber, how often do you get in the wrong spot sometimes? Right. And it's hard the then in the middle of the race <laughs> to be like, Oh, I messed up. Like looking behind you. Don't, don't pay attention right here. Um, <laughs> that can be. Uh, I'm thinking of other things of very high level cyclists who I thought would, you know, it's the last lap, let's do it. I'm going to put you in a position. And we're like 15 wheels back. And I'm like, what, what are we doing here? This isn't the right position. And so I, just be aware of that. But if you can find a yeah. Peter Ramber who's right most of the time, that'd be amazing. It doesn't have to be somebody, you know, who's really good. One of the things you can do is kind of watch the group on the first day and figure out like that person seems to always be where I want to be, or mm -hmm. that person seems to always be there when the breakaway goes. And then you can say, okay, maybe that's the person I want to try to shadow tomorrow. And yeah, I yeah. think, I think that's really one of the, one of the really nice things about stage races is it removes the variable of a bunch of different people showing up for a one day race where you have no idea who it is and what's going to go on and how the race is going to be attacked. If you're with the same 40 or hundred or whatever people every day for multiple days in a row, you're going to be able to pick out who you should be around when they're doing a good job. And it also, you don't have to worry about someone coming from, you know, out of town or whatever you you've seen all these people racing in the same races that you're, you've been doing for multiple days, you're going to have a much better idea of what's going to happen and what you don't and what you do and don't have to worry about. And so for people who get really anxious for racing, remind yourself that a stage race is actually less anxious because there's less variables going on, which is mm -hmm. for, for some people, that's very, very important. 
Yeah, I wish and every, it seems like, counterintuitive, but it's very true. Sorry, go ahead, Nate. <laughs> no, I zoom. Uh, I I wish every race was a stage race that I did. It's so much more efficient for time, especially for us because we have to drive. It's so much fun. There's more opportunities for points. You learn faster. What Pete said, it's like it's way more fun when you know everyone. And then to Amber and Pete's point too, let's say someone's in the great position on the first day for the sprint. Well, oftentimes those same people are in the great position for day two, day three, day four, right? It's the same kind of mix of five people and everyone else is behind. So in that case, when you can identify them, yeah, last three laps, get on their wheel and get in that right position if you want to be in that sort of situation, which can be a little scary for new racers for sure. Totally. And I know science exists on this, but I don't have it. Uh, I, but so I don't, I guess I don't have any science to back this up, but when you do change, I know strange, right? Uh, when you do change the, uh, the circumstances of any sort of a situation, it can have a profound effect on learning. Like for children, for example, uh, uh, my, my son goes to a Montessori school and it's, it's super cute in their classroom. Like everything is sized for a child. Everything is like organized in a very consistent manner so that they know what to expect. And we did the same thing at our house for him as well. So we tried it. He has tiny chairs. He has tiny everything, right? It's all like kind of like his size. But one of the things that they point to with that, and I've noticed this as well, it doesn't take much, but if you change your circumstances, a lot of the time you forget what you know, or at the very least, it makes it a lot harder to observe the important details and filter signal and noise. Um, because really that's the best part of the stage race. In my opinion, is the fact that once again, since it's the same competition that allows you to pick up way more information because you waste so much, it's not wasteful, but you spend so much energy, mental energy and focus in a race, trying to figure out who you're racing against. That's like one of the biggest things that you need to do when you're in a fresh race and you don't know who they are. You have to figure out who you're up against because that's really the main thing. It's less about you racing the course, more about you racing other people. So when you're in the stage race, it suddenly removes so many variables. And just like any equation, if you remove a bunch of variables and you only have a couple to focus on, it's a way easier equation to solve. So it's the, it's the same thing. If you can make anything more consistent, then you're going to accelerate your learning or simplify your context to make it so that you can learn faster. I miss stage races. Just like talking about this, I want to race so bad, uh, especially stage They're races. They're so fun. Aren't they? Yeah. Pete and I actually did a 10 mile TT, socially distanced, Who totally won? asynchronous TT. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pete, so Pete's just hold on giggling. Here. Hold on here. <laughs> we, John, John here. <laughs> and by how much? Let me set the scene here. Okay. So we, we, we laid out a 10 mile TT, oh, a lot of 10 mile TT courses. Mm -hmm. Um, this one I think is our flattest one, but Pete and I, I had so, an idea. Yeah. If we're just going to ride our local crit course also for 10 <laughs> miles. And <laughs> so that'll be really flat too, but, um, but <clears throat> flat course. And we did it at totally different times. I saw Pete and kind of waved to him from across the road when I was, when he was leaving and I was uh, coming up to it, but uh, 10 miles, Pete and I in totally different spots with training and everything else. I lost to Pete by five seconds, <laughs> 25 minute time trial. And I lost to him by five seconds. Killed did me. you wax your chain? No, I did not. There's five I seconds. Right I there. didn't either Guaranteed. though. So next time, next weekend, I'm definitely waxing the chain for the, for the 10 miles. <laughs> and yeah. I, <clears throat> I do think we're going to try to do most. We're going to try to continue to do these because I need something to look forward to, to be totally honest at, at the most basic level, I need something to be excited about in a short time duration away from now. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. We'll talk about <laughs> you want to, you want to do them, Nate? Saturday's my day off, but if we do a long gravel race or ride, I'd like to inside of that gravel ride, we should have a 10 mile TT. Okay. That would be dope. Sure. 10 mile gravel also, TT. You could also do, you're welcome to do, um, do it on Sunday too. Yeah. I mean, I know the weather might be different and that sort of a thing, but um, it's not like Pete and I have any sort of, it's not like it's an official thing. Uh, we just planned out 10 miles and anytime you can in the weekend, go and do it. So I, I like this thing called structure training and I follow a training plan <laughs> and Sundays are pretty important rides for me. Actually, I have it, that be the most important ride because I have Saturday off. So I, yeah, it's, gotcha. it's 10 miles. Isn't the same as a whole bunch of VO2 max. I Correct. did my workout. I did my, an outside workout and then I did the TT. So there we cool. go. So you can still get it done. That's five so. seconds right there too. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm faster. So hopefully uh, that's what I tell myself at least. Okay. John has a question about when to bump up training volume. He says, 
having been using low volume plan builder for nine months with great improvements from 164 to 242 FTP. Holy cow, John. Uh, he says, wow. I'm fully aware gains become not as significant as you become more fit and that any gain is, is a success. However, based on how my body feels over the past two months, as well as comments Chad has made on previous podcasts, he has a question. He says, my question is, do you tend to see a ceiling effect with low volume training eventually? meaning that eventually you bump up against the stops of what it can do for you, so to speak. To fully take advantage of my possible potential, have I possibly come to a point where switching to mid-volume would have a greater probability or success at getting me closer to my goal of 300 watts? Any advice or direction is greatly appreciated. I would not be anywhere near where I am today without using Trainer Road. You all are, tr are truly changing people's lives for the better in addition to making them faster, and that's pretty sweet if you ask me. I agree. It's pretty cool. He says, keep up the amazing work and know you are greatly appreciated by many. Uh, wish you all nothing but the best. Cheers to our family from John. That's really cool. Thanks, John, for, for doing that. Um, so I Thanks, guess the, the question, yeah, the, the root here, my question is, do you tend to see a ceiling effect with low volume eventually? Um, okay, there's two things on this. One, we talked about that ML project that has many more features than I have just talked about. But um, <laughs> in general, there is a correlation between more volume and a higher FTP. The question is for you, is more volume going to be a higher FTP? Because for every single person in the world, there is a amount of volume where your FTP does not increase. You become less consistent, you're sporadic, or you can overtrain and stuff goes down and bad things happen. Right. I think, uh, any, any of us ever had that happen to us? I think every one of us, right? Oh, yeah. We've all done it. All of us. Um, so, uh, personally, I have tried to jump too high and it's kind of kept me down a few times. I would keep going on low volume until you have a sustained pl plateau, like two blocks where your FTP hasn't increased. Now let's try to add some volume. Unless for some reason you were like, I am fresh every day after my hard workouts, I feel like I could do more workouts. Um, I'm sleeping well, everything feels amazing. Uh, I would, I would not, or you can also go a little bit in between, you can add just one 60 minute easy ride and step up, say, Hey, for this block, I'm going to add one Wednesday, 60 minute, uh, I don't know, call C minus three or something like that. That's, that's not so bad hard. That's some extra volume, some extra Z two that could lead to higher, uh, gains in the future. These big jumps mm -hmm. are when I think we all really get in trouble. And that's where I've, I've gotten in trouble. Pete probably Amber too. When you do those big jumps of volume all at once. Um, for me, I find I'm, I think 500 TSS is better than me, better for me than high volume because of with my lifestyle and stuff, I just can't do more. So, um, you can also try to look into better sleep, nutrition, recovery to maximize the gains of that volume for those people that can't do more than low volume. I'm going to get enough sleep. I'm going to have excellent nutrition and, uh, I'm going to do a recovery shake and get the cell or the signaling, you know, after I, after I ride and all that sort of stuff. Um, I don't, that's, that's how I feel about that. Don't go too. Wait till you, wait till you plateau, I, I would say. Yeah. So a and, good sign that you've reached it is like a plateau. You're saying Nate, like if you've gotten to a point where you've been through 12 weeks of training and you're just not seeing any improvements, that sort of a thing. And you're just consistent. Yeah. And then at that or point eight, you might be. Yeah. Yeah. Two, four weeks. Like if you're the same, I would, uh, I would not one, I sometimes stuff can happen with one and you get like a little bug and you don't even realize it. But if you get two and you're not going up, I would look at if sleep, nutrition, recovery are good, I would look at extra volume. Yeah. Amber, sorry. We, uh, we, we took you off right when you raised your hand. <laughs> Not at all. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, when you're considering increasing volume, remember that by when you increase volume, you also have to put additional effort into other things like fueling, making sure that you're sleeping, making sure that you're recovering. So the effort, the difference of effort, isn't just about the time that you're going to put into that training, but it's everything else that goes around that because with more training comes the need for more recovery and other kind of ancillary components of your training. So just keep in mind that it's not just going to be about like, oh, I'll just add on a 30 minutes here, but there's a lot of effort that comes with that as well. And you don't want to forget about that either. This is, I, I'm going to flip it the other way too, Amber, right? Like not just if you're going to do more volume, you have to sleep more, you have to eat better, but let's look at the other aspects of life. If you have a more demanding job, if you're going through a more demanding situation, a high stress situation for one reason or another, that also requires more sleep. Like it's almost like, look at like the, the, 
because really when you're getting faster, it's not when you're, uh, you know, giving yourself those do dosing yourself with the work. It's when you're recovering from it. That's when your body adapts. That's when your body gets faster. So that part, part of time is like sacred. Think of that in your life as like something you don't want to transgress. You don't want to get rid of, but the stress that you put into life will take portions of that and it's finite. So how much of the available recovery time that you have is going to be dedicated to training or other things. So they're physically speaking, Nate could probably take, uh, you know, right now, 500 TSS, maybe more, but back when Nate was really just getting trainer road off the ground and nights, lunch times, everything else, doing all the work that he was doing, you couldn't have tolerated 500 TSS, right, Nate? Like 200 was incredibly hard. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not just about like what you can physically tolerate and we're really bad at boxing these and compartmentalizing them and treating them totally separately when they really do affect us. Uh, it's, it's, it's a huge, it's an important thing to keep in mind. I'm sure you noticed this too, Pete, going from uh, a more high demand job here now with us here at trainer road. Whereas before when you were able to focus more time on training and racing. Yeah. I, you guys witnessed it firsthand where I just couldn't train at the same capacity I was used to. And I got a lot slower because work was difficult and Sorry. took energy and time. No, I, I, right. It was, it was worth it. I'm, I will, I will always take that trade. But, um, one of the things that started to help me along when I started doing low, lower volume is you have to focus on nailing your workouts. If you're not nailing your three low volume workouts per week, there's no way you need more volume right? Like let's not, let's not even bring that into the equation. Let's focus on nailing your three workouts. And if you're doing that consistently, and especially if you've been training for nine months, um, you're still going to see some growth. And as long as you're nailing your workouts, then that kind of opens the door to thinking about other things you could do. But if you're not nailing your workouts, and I know a lot of people that still struggle with low volume workouts because of various, it has nothing to do with willpower and physical prowess. It has to do with many other things in their life. And so if you're not nailing your workouts, that's a great green light or red light to not do more volume. Or if you're nailing your workouts, you've been nailing them for months and months. Let's, let's think about what we can do next. And if you are nailing your workouts, I think a better way to step up volume rather than adding an extra day is to tack on 10 or 20 minutes to one of those three workouts at the end, use our extend workout function raise it to like a Z2 aerobic kind of level and just put a little bit extra because having that full day of recovery is amazing. And that little extra you'll get, you know, in that week, you'll add up three twenties is an hour, right? You're like, wow, I just got an extra hour. I increased my volume by what to almost 25% by mm -hmm. just those three twenties and without having to, and you, it's an easier way to having to like, oh, I'm going to have a whole extra day working out. I got to change my schedule and all this sort of stuff. And then if you find you can't nail your workouts, you just take those twenties off where you do some to tens. Yep. There's a, a metaphor that I want to use for this too, for a point that was made earlier that I think that it's important to explain this further, go into more depth. It's that if you're doing low volume training, you can get more out of that training most likely than what you're currently getting out of it now. So Pete's talking about nailing your workouts. And actually, I guess before I go into this point, Pete, what do you mean by that? By nailing your workouts? Do you mean just completing them or can you go into more depth on that? <clears throat> well, um, if you're doing your workout as prescribed and you're able to knock out interval after interval, you're never struggling in recoveries. You're never pausing like we know now about uh, people kind of sneaking in pauses here and there. Um, it's, it's every single time you should be really, uh, you should feel like you were taxed and you completed something that was strenuous, but you're still hungry for more in, in a, not, I want to do another workout right now, but I can't wait for the next workout. That's a, I think that's the better way to phrase it. Like you do your workout on Tuesday. You can't wait for Thursday to knock out the next workout. And if you're feeling that feeling, then I think that's, um, that's the underlying feeling you want when you're able to actually possibly take more on. Yeah. Go, Go that, what do you think, that's John? A thirst Sorry. Oh. Go ahead, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's making yourself forgive the metaphor here once again, but a sponge, like, but the properly like saturated sponge, like in the sense that a lot of the time, if you're just throwing all the work, the work is a constant flow of water, whatever it is, that's what it is. It's this much TSS. But if you're not able to absorb that, 
effectively, then it's you're you're uselessly throwing stress at yourself because it's just not going to sit into that sponge. It's going to run off. And the way that you make yourself a more receptive sponge in that regard is better sleep, better nutrition. It's like doubling down. I bet a lot of people could actually get faster, even if they've plateaued, like try sleeping more. Even if you don't feel like you're really like pushing up against the stops and super fatigued, try sleeping more. And I bet you'll get more out of that 300 TSS a week that you're doing just from sleeping more or try eating higher quality, more whole foods, more things that are rich in different, uh, different sources, like eat different things, different colors, that sort of stuff. I bet that you'll get more out of your training. It's, it's, it's cool because it, a lot of the time we just break it down to being so simple as I need to train more. And if I train more, I'll get faster, but there are a lot of other levers you can move. And it all revolves around making yourself better at recovering instead of just better at, at training. There was this, uh, I think it was April fool's joke or just someone put on the internet that Instagram, uh, was coming out with a feature where you could see anyone who screenshotted your story in the last three years. And millions of millennials screamed out in like terror, uh, because <laughs> like they did not want people to know that, but you can track that inside of iOS, um, and probably Android too. I'm not sure. But what Pete is alluding to is we've been tracking your pausing data. So all of you who have been doing two by 20, <laughs> but that 20 minutes, you had five minute breaks in between. Um, we, that's, that's what we have in an internal data because we need to be able to know, did you pause? Cause that changes the workout completely. Um, and I know that's not displayed to you at the moment, but we'd like to display that to you in the future because that's important information, right? When you look back at your workout, you can't always remember that you stopped in the middle of, mm -hmm. uh, of your over unders and took a break and you pause the timer. Um, but it is very important to know about your progression of fitness, that data. So I, yeah, for sure. we should like, yeah, we won't, <laughs> I don't know. We push them all to Strava. Nate. Everyone's like, Oh my gosh. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, Amber. Do you have anything else to add on this one before we move on to Andrew's question? No, I think we really covered it all. Cool. Uh, let's go into Andrew's and we're going to hit rapid fire. Uh, Andrew's is going to be more in depth. He says, hello, trainer road coaches. Thank you for all. Uh, thank you all for helping making in making me a better cyclist and for making a product and service that has such a positive impact on people. He says, I always hear about the ideal recovery ratio of four units of carbs to one unit of protein. This is what a lot of people talk about in a traditional recovery shake, right? Amber. Um, and he says, uh, you usually take this shortly after a workout. Now, Amber spoke recently, and it has been covered many times about how to fuel workouts with carbs before and during. I typically work out early and attempt to make up the, the calorie deficit that he has during, as opposed to before the workout and typically max out my consumption at about 90 grams of carbs per hour. I understand that it may not be an actual max, but this is my max now. So does it still make sense to maintain the carb protein ratio if I've already loaded up with carbs? So this question, Amber gets to like a big thing that we've talked about with this minimum effective dose with carbs. And we are the, we, as a people, I'm saying people in general, not us, uh, we are champions of the opposite, but we, as a people are obsessed with finding the minimum effective dose of carbs. Like, well, cause the assumption carbs make you fat. So what's the absolute minimum amount that I can take in with still being able to get by. And it's a problem and it's making you slower if you're hearing this yeah. and you have that perspective. So hopefully what we can cover with this one is the opposite of that and try to inform why you actually want to take on more carbohydrate. Uh, Nate, your notes are first on this one. Do we want to go to that or, or do we want to just toss it to Amber? Uh, mine are real quick. And then we can go into way deep with Amber in general. Okay. What they've seen is it's not about, it's like your daily carb intake. Um, Amber's going to talk about some the benefits of the recovery shake too, but what they've seen in general is if you're doing more than two point two and a half hours of aerobic activity in a day, your performance increases up to eight to 10 kilograms per, or sorry, grams per kilogram of body weight <laughs> a day. So these are like, even, um, uh, like marathon runners, like Kenyans who are doing 120 miles a week or some crazy like that. They don't increase the performance after 10. So it looks like there's some upper limit of 10 uh, grams per kilogram of body weight of gram of carbs. If you're doing less, probably around six grams per kilogram of body weight is optimal, um, to increase performance. That six grams per kilogram body weight is way more, I bet you, than you're thinking. And in my experience doing my own fitness pal stuff is that the fat intake is with, 
if you eat anything that's like you didn't make yourself, even if you make it yourself, the fat is so easy to get and then it messes, it's really hard to hit your caloric target with and hit that six grams. So even six grams per kilogram body weight is probably more than most of you are doing uh, for your regular, you know, 90 minutes a day, an hour a day, stuff like that. Before we hand it over to Amber, I want to, I don't want to re, uh, I want to emphasize one point that you said, Nate, it wasn't that eating eight to 10 grams of carbs per kilogram of body weight avoided bonking by a certain percentage. It's the eight to 10 grams of carbs per kilogram. You see improvement as you eat more all the way up until that point, improvement in performance. So you actually are faster, you're stronger, you're outputting more yeah. work as a result of that, right? That's a huge point is that people are like, since you, they'll say, I don't need it because I'm not bonking. Therefore I should get whatever, uh, whatever the, the, the amount is that I'm just over that line is my target line, which, and that's the thing, because I don't want to get fat. And what's, I think what's super interesting, I, I don't know if I've said this in the podcast before, but they've done studies where they put people in these metabolic changers where they measure all the gas in and out. They measure the stool, like everything that comes out from the toilet. They have researchers and they create very specific food to be able to understand how many calories you're getting. And they keep people in these chambers for a long time. Like I want to say 14 days or more, and it's just bored in there. So they can measure how much they're actually moving. And by uh, measuring how much they're breathing out, they can measure how many calories they're burning and everything that's coming out of their body. They give people high carb diet or high fat diet, right? Cause they want to see, cause people say, Hey, carbs make you fat. In, in the study that I'm thinking of, uh, which I don't have a link to, it's on the science, science of we'll get, stronger by stronger by science podcast. We can find it later. And but we'll put it in after this episode in oh, the forums. So you're going to make me look for it. Just listen to the science <laughs> by stronger podcast or stronger by science podcast. That's an excellent podcast for all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, um, I lost my train of stop, thought concussion. Oh yeah. So a afterwards, actually the group that had high carb lost a little more body fat than the group that was high fat for the same calories, but it wasn't enough to be statistically significant. So basically for science fact, it was just calories and calories out. They did not, their weight didn't change and their body composition didn't change between the two, uh, the two, uh, diets. Groups. And now you, you would think that, oh, that's because I, it doesn't make sense. If you think that carbs make you fat and it, it makes it so you cannot burn fat as soon as you're eating carbs. It just like blows your mind. Um, there's some researchers on that stronger by science that will do a much better job of explaining that than I will. But if you know that that's the outcome, it's so, uh, it might change the way you think about nutrition, especially inside of cycling that carbs mm -hmm. actually don't make you fat. Yeah. Amber, maybe we want to start off with addressing the term topped off and I'm using quotes here. If you're listening on the podcast and then we can get into everything else here. Cause topped off is like uh, a big assumption where it's like, well, I just had a pancake, so I'm topped off. Um, or <laughs> <laughs> like I took in 90 grams of carbs, so I'm topped off. What is topped off? Like, and, and maybe that's probably a good point to address before we get into the specifics. Yeah. So there's, there's probably a couple of different ways of thinking about that, but primarily you're thinking about, um, in terms of your training, your glycogen stores, so that would be liver glycogen, but also muscle glycogen. And then in terms of this particular question, taking in carbohydrate during your workout. So staying ahead, quote unquote, on your energy needs, right? So are you taking in enough, <laughs> quote unquote, <laughs> are you taking in enough, uh, to, to keep up with the energy demands and what's actually being burned? So there's the topped off in terms of glycogen storage, and then also staying ahead on the energy demands of the actual workout that you're doing. And it's, yeah, we'll get into that a little bit, but that's probably what, what this question is referring to, or if somebody was going to talk about being quote unquote topped off on carbs, those would be mm -hmm. sort of the, the, the factors that we're considering. And it's super tough to ever actually be topped off, especially post-workout. I've never been yes. topped off post-workout and I've, and like, I just did a ride where I fueled with 120 grams of carbs per hour. I still probably wasn't topped off. Like it's, it's right. really tough to be topped off. That's the, that's days. the thing. So Yes. Days of and no it's activity a, it, and lots of carbs. Uncomfortable yeah. process, or honestly. Activity. Like, yeah. 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 So, so don't think you're topped off if you're not. Um, don't think that you've reached a point where you don't need to take anything else in. 
Right. So while we're doing definitions, let me do a couple caveats because as we talk about <laughs> this, uh, let's be real specific here. So I'm going to restrict this discussion to post-workout intake. Now, what Nate was saying about uh, taking in six to 10 grams of carbs per kilogram of body weight over the course of the day, that's actually a really key thing because what the, what the current research is suggesting is that the two most important factors to improving your performance and getting faster are the training stimulus and how well you are consuming nutrition over the course of the whole day to meet your energy demands. So that's the most important thing. Now, if we want to get a little bit better than that, we can look at your nutrition before, during, and after your workout. And there's a really, really nice review paper that we'll link here. It's uh, by Arendt et al. And it's a 2020 review of nutrient timing specifically, but this is a direct quote from the paper. And they say, in the context of sports nutrition for optimizing performance and recovery, which is what we want to do, the issue of consuming nutrients should not be separated into before, during, or after, but should be combined as before, during, and after. And I think this is getting to the crux of the question here. So when we talk about this today, uh, we're talking about post-workout intake. I'm going to talk about carbohydrate and protein. We're not going to get into the weeds on type of protein, type of carbohydrate. We're going to kind of keep this at a high level. And then this is all applicable to healthy exercising adults. Okay. So it may not apply in the same way to, um, physiology where there's metabolic disorder or something like that. But when we're talking about healthy exercising adults, uh, this is sort of the framework that we're going to use to talk about this today. So I've definitely been a big fan of the four to one carbohydrate to protein ratio in the post-workout recovery. And the reason that I'm a fan of that is because it stacks the deck in your favor. The majority of studies that look at using a combination of carbohydrate and protein for recovery use a four to one ratio. And many of these studies show an increase in performance and really no performance detriment. And that's key. Um, is this optimal? <laughs> is it ideal? Who knows? <laughs> and honestly, that's, that's the honest answer. No one really knows. So if I've ever used the word optimal or ideal, I apologize for that because it's not a precise use of the language and it's not exactly accurate. The, f the idea that we could actually identify an ideal or optimal ratio is almost impossible. There's just so many different factors, individual physiology, type duration, intensity of exercise, type of carbohydrate, type of protein. There are just so many factors involved that it, it makes it almost kind of ridiculous to think that we could come up with a silver bullet ratio that's going to apply across the board. But let's talk about why carbohydrate and protein are effective. So there's a few concepts at play here in terms of this question. And the idea that what you're taking in during your workout as carbohydrate would top you off and serve the same function as a carbohydrate that you would take after your workout is not quite right. So the timing effect here is a really important component. The effect of the carbohydrate that you take in during exercise is gonna have a different effect than what you take in immediately after or long after your workout, and that's because hormones. The hormones that are upregulated during exercise are really different than the ones that are gonna be upregulated at rest, and how they're interacting is gonna be really different, and that's going to affect, that's going to determine the effect of the carbohydrate that you're taking in at that time. So the carbohydrate you're taking in during is really serving the purpose of trying to catch up on the energy and fuel consumption because you're in a catabolic state. This is the state where you're breaking things down, you're consuming, you're burning fuel, you're taking big molecules, making them smaller, burning them up to fuel the effort that you're putting out for your workout. The carbohydrate after is for rebuilding those energy and fuel stores. So this is your anabolic state. So instead of breaking things down and consuming, you are putting them together and building to replenish those stores. Um, another quote from this aren't it all uh, review article, which is a great one. Again, if you want to read that on your own, the quote is post-exercise carbohydrate and protein intake have the ability to increase blood glucose levels, decrease cortisol and increase substrate availability, thus amplifying the body's shift from a catabolic to a more anabolic state. And that's really the key here is you're shifting from catabolic and sympathetic to anabolic and parasympathetic. And that's really what the recovery shake is about. Yeah. Jonathan. So this is, I just want to recap something that Amber is saying here. In other words, there are different reasons for taking in carbohydrate while you're training and after. So they're not mutually exclusive. They are not the same as well. It's not like you can do one to then make up for a lack with the other, but there's reasons to take in carbohydrate that are unique for each one of those scenarios. Is that, is that correct, Amber? 
Yeah, and I think Nate wanted to jump in too. Yeah, I I was want to say I, we're gonna beat it into beat this point in the ground three times. What you're saying <laughs> is body rebuild by doing this, mm -hmm. and that's what you're doing, and it's gonna switch you into a state to be to be able to rebuild. That's that's the exactly. that's the goal. Exactly. Now here on this podcast, we want to make you faster. So what we're really interested in are the performance outcomes. And there is a, a nice um, meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials that looked at, and this is a 2020 meta-analysis. Uh, we'll link this one as well. But they looked at studies that were uh, trying to examine the difference between carbohydrate only versus carbohydrate plus protein. And they looked at intake during and after exercise. They looked at effects on time to exhaustion and effects on time trial performance. And they were, again, we're looking at this carbohydrate versus carbohydrate plus protein. So most of the studies that they found used a four to one ratio by far, like the vast majority used a four to one ratio. Um, the next most common ratio was a three to one ratio. And then there were some smaller ones in there as well. When they looked at isocaloric intake, which is you use the exact same amount of calories, but in one case, it's hundred percent carbohydrate. And in the other case, it's carbohydrate and protein. There was no difference, no significant difference in the efficacy. So they're about the same. Um, what they did find was carbohydrate plus protein, not isocaloric, but carbohydrate plus protein was showed a significant increase in time to exhaustion in instances where the athletes had a greater than eight hour, re hour recovery window. So the, the biggest effect was seen when the recovery window was pretty long, as opposed to a shorter four hour recovery recovery window. Um, and that's the case for most athletes who are training once a day and even training daily is that's going to be kind of what your recovery window is. And so, and again, time to exhaustion, it's not the best metric. Um, and the authors were really good in this, in this, uh, meta-analysis about d going through and, uh, detailing all of the differences across these studies, because they're different experimental protocols, different types of carbohydrate, different types of protein. So all of this, we need to take with a big grain of salt, but if we're just looking for general trends and what the, the very rich body of research is kind of pointing us to. The take home message is that carbohydrate plus protein is at least as effective as carbohydrate only. It might be more effective and it's definitely not less effective, which means that adding protein to your carbohydrate is a pretty good bet, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nate, you talk a lot about asymmetric risk here. I think this is a pretty good example. Yeah. Like what's the downside? The, so yeah. the downside is it's, um, the, the extra calories, right? And 20 grams of protein. Um, what is that times four would be 80, 20, 40, 60, 80, 80 calories, right? Am I doing this right? Right. Yep. It's not mm -hmm. much. It's like mm -mm. the 80 calories is not much food. So I wouldn't even worry about that. And that's very easy to remove 80 calories later in the day. Um, so why not do it? And what's yeah. interesting is a lot of the studies that are looking at performance, the more intake you have after your workout, the better the performance increase. <laughs> so mm -hmm. when they were looking at the isocaloric studies, for example, what showed the biggest, the biggest difference was more calories equaled better performance. And so have, you know, it wasn't just about the carbohydrate and protein versus carbohydrate only, but also the amount of energy that you're taking in to, to replenish your energy stores. That's really key here. So I would say even like the quote unquote extra calories, like that's not even a bad thing. I don't, there's just not really a downside here. Yeah. And so, when you look at the potential yeah. upside, it's just so high. Right. And that's, right. The, that's the potential upside is your workouts are more successful. You don't feel run down so that your workout makes you unable for the rest of the things that you need to do that day. You're able to recover better. There's just so many upsides. So, yeah. Right. And, and the thing about this stuff, especially nutritional science is there are so many unknowns. There are so many mechanis mechanistic pathways that we just don't understand because it's really, really hard to study them, especially in human beings. Um, and so we're, we're operating in a very, uh, we're just operating in the middle of a lot of uncertainty is what it comes down to. And so again, part of why we make this recommendation is okay. In the face of all of this uncertainty, what are the things that you know, what are the trends that we see that we can capitalize on to stack the deck in your favor? And that's really what we're trying to do. But we can look at a few kind of mechanistic pathways. Um, there's a lot of, we'll say there's a lot of different recovery pathways. There's three primary ones that are investigated in the literature. These likely contribute to improved performance, but the 
the explicit mechanisms by which that they they might do so are really unclear. So this is this is not to say that these are the reasons, but it's interesting to think about. Um, and the three things that I'm going to talk about quickly are glycogen. We want to replenish this muscle protein breakdown. We want to reduce this, right? Because if you're breaking down proteins, what we want to do is we want to protect and conserve the lean mass that you work so hard to build, right? So we don't want to break that down. And then the last one is muscle protein synthesis. So avoiding breakdown is one thing, but actually synthesizing new muscle is a totally different pathway. So those are the three things that we're looking for with recovery. And then we'll look at glycogen first. So the obvious protagonist here is carbohydrate. Glycogen is carbohydrate. So taking carbohydrate makes sense. Um, one of the things that has long been in the literature that's being called a little bit more into question now is what's called the anabolic window. We've talked about this. This is where immediately following your workout, you have an upregulation of what's called glute four transporters. And what these do is they just make your muscles, uh, they increase your muscles ability to take in glucose and repl replenish muscle glycogen stores. So what the science is saying now is we kind of used to look at this as like, oh, you've got to hit that window or else. But what the, what the science is showing us now is that that little window, and this is the analogy the authors use in the paper, it might actually be like this huge gaping garage door. <laughs> <laughs> and so that window is, it's not required. You don't have to hit it, but if you do hit it with carbohydrate intake, the replenishment of glycogen will be faster. You can achieve the same end by doing what Nate said and having high levels of carbohydrate consistently throughout the rest of your day, you'll likely replenish your glycogen stores by the next day. But if you just hit it right after that workout, then it's kind of like an insurance policy. You know, it's going to replenish, it's going to replenish fast, and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, yeah, go ahead. It's a uh, do both, right? Because yeah, that you're not going to get the six grams per carbs, with just your one recovery. That would be a heck of a recovery shake. Uh, you're gonna have diarrhea for days. Uh, don't don't. So it's it's uh, that's doing both. I think is a is an excellent in to maximize performance. We talked about that the previous question about low volume maximizing it. Whew, do both of those things right, and that could get yes. your performance even further on the same volume. Which for all of us, everyone's like probably time strapped on this listening to this podcast. Exactly. What an amazing way to make every minute you put into training to get more out of it. And I think that's right. like the, the goal for all of us. Right, exactly. So this was one of the interesting things that they looked at was uh, if you're not gonna hit that window, what's another way to replenish and maximize the glycogen resynthesis? And the protocol that is sort of the consensus based on this review is to have one to 1.5 grams per kilogram per hour carbohydrate within two hours of your workout, then every 15 to 30 minutes, for four to six hours. <laughs> like if you really want to maximize that resynthesis, this is the protocol that they recommend. And let's be honest, this is not really conducive to most people's normal lives. Like, I don't know about you, but some people work out in the evening and they might, might not even have six hours before they're going to go to bed, let alone the time to set an alarm, get up, have some carbohydrate every 15 minutes. It's just not practical. So this is a good example of where what we see in the lab as being maximized or potentially optimal isn't necessarily applicable or realistic for real life application. Um, and one of the interesting things to note in this paper too, is they mentioned that the timed ingestion of post-exercise carbohydrate, and this is a direct, direct quote, has never been shown to have negative implications on performance. So again, there's no downside to this and you can only stack the deck in your favor with this. And capitalizing on that window while it's not essential or required, it's really efficient. And it's a great opportunity to get that energy replenished in a, in a short amount of time without having to have some kind of a carbohydrate drip or IV for the rest of the day. <laughs> I was just you gonna know, this... say, Amber, this is like uh, stage races. Uh, Nate, I'm thinking back to Valley of the Sun uh, when we did that one with Ryan Standish and Keegan Swenson drink. And, uh, they <laughs> are really good at this. They just didn't stop eating. Like they, they had that carbohydrate drip, so to speak going the, I wonder what Nate's drinking. It's not normally colored. Um, oh, it's, it's just coffee. I assume. Nope. Tart cherry juice. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> gains. Duh. Um, uh, <laughs> duh. <laughs> <laughs> what else would I, it be? That's a bad um, boss thing to say. <laughs> Duh. Sorry. Like, sorry you know. That's what we're friends. That's what we're peers. That's how I we're exactly. I you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But th that's um uh but they're really good at that. I'm sure you saw that too, Amber, like with um uh, whether it's pro athletes, anything else, they're really good at kind of attaching that drip cart to them of carbs in the sense that they're mm -hmm. constantly taking in food afterward and and just making sure they do that it's one of the things that separates athletes like this um it makes them better remember For sure. and oh, yeah. i'm sorry i just got to say this remember way back in the day carb trickle my my <laughs> problem with that was i did not um it wasn't big enough i was keeping it too small um but anyways that's what this that's what it harkens back to remember i was like i want to eat like a bunch of carbs a little bit all day long to try to yes. slowly feed back my uh my glycogen post-workout Mm -hmm. Now there's finally yeah. like at least somebody said science around it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Amber, um, I guess that, so that covers the glycogen side of, or the, the carbohydrate side of things. What about protein plus carbohydrate? Right. So again, we kind of said a carbohydrate likely protagonist for glycogen, but what about protein and protein actually has a really positive effect on glycogen resynthesis. And we know this because it's been shown to increase muscle glycogen synthesis. And this is likely due to an increase in insulin secretion because protein, the presence of protein actually helps trigger an insulin, um, an insulin response. And this likely helps the muscles be able to take, take up that carbohydrate to resynthesize glycogen. Um, so again, to that question, how much protein, uh, seems that there's some consensus around about 0.4 grams per kilogram per hour plus carbohydrate. Probably it may stimulate glycogen synthesis more than carbohydrate alone especially if the carbohydrate is intake is low. And by that, they mean less than about a gram to 1.2 grams per kilogram per hour. And again, this is just for mus muscle glycogen. So adding protein might help it's, and it's not going to hurt. It's not going to reduce the efficacy of the carbohydrate that you're going to take in and it might help. And so why not is mm -hmm. really what it comes down to. Um, and that, and that's really, and, and I do think that that's interesting, right? Because you sort of think about like the, the, the protein would be for your muscle and the lean mass and the carbohydrate would be for the glycogen, but they both work synergistically to resynthesize glycogen. And that brings mm -hmm. us to muscle protein breakdown. And again, this is the one that we want to reduce. We want to reduce the breakdown. So muscle damage and glycogen depletion both contribute to protein breakdown. So we know this, your muscles, you know, you're using your muscles, there's micro damage that's going to happen. But the other thing that causes the, the protein breakdown is glycogen depletion. Cause if you deplete a lot of glycogen and you don't have protein and carbohydrate coming in, your body is going to find existing protein to break down in order to make new glycogen. So surprisingly carbohydrate intake post-exercise decreases muscle protein breakdown. So carbohydrate alone protects your lean mass when, right? This is good but it doesn't have any effect on muscle protein synthesis. So carbohydrate can protect existing lean mass, but it's not going to help you build new lean mass. This is also likely related to some, to insulin protein also helps reduce, uh, muscle protein breakdown and protein in particular, because carbohydrate can't promote muscle protein synthesis. The protein is the key when you want to make new lean muscle and that's brings us to the, the muscle protein synthesis. So carbohydrate does nothing for this. You need protein to increase this. Um, the need for protein post-exercise to trigger muscle protein synthesis is affirmed by the International Society of Sports Nutrition. They have a position statement from 2017. We can link that one too, but this is absolutely critical if you want to promote muscle protein synthesis, making new muscles. So what's the optimal amount of protein for muscle protein synthesis? Who knows? <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. Um, one study showed that 20 grams of high quality fast absorbing protein increased muscle protein synthesis after resistance and high intensity aerobic training. This wasn't normalized by weight and other studies have shown that higher doses of protein can elicit higher muscle protein synthesis in some cases. Uh, so mm. as far as a minimum effective dose, no idea as far as optimal, no idea, but we do know that the protein presence of protein is going to help with muscle protein synthesis. We know it's going to help preserve lean mass by reducing muscle protein breakdown, and it's going to help with the glycogen repletion. So these are all win good things. So bringing this back full circle, why would we recommend four to one post-workout recovery drink? 
Most of the research that's been done on this uses four to one. Many of those studies show positive performance outcomes, which is all we really care about here. <laughs> and it's not going to hurt, right? There's no downside. Um, it's, it's like insurance, having a recovery drink right after every workout, you're taking advantage of that window of opportunity. It's not necessary, but it's like a little insurance plan. You know, you've hit that, you know, you put in the carbohydrate and protein to trigger those recovery systems. So that's all good. Um, again, this is about signaling. You want to train your body to shift from catabolic to anabolic. You want to train your body to shift from sympathetic to parasympathetic and Nate already nailed this one, but it's also kind of a psychological routine that signals you to be like, okay, body, we did the work. It's time to rest and digest and rebuild. And that, that routine and even the flavor, the experience of having the shake every workout, it creates a nice Pavlovian response for your body to be like, okay, time to chill, rebuild, recover. And then lastly, getting back to what we touched on, which is the lab versus practical real life application. What we want to do is build habits, right? So in this case, by creating kind of a standard post-workout recovery drink for yourself, you can reap 90% of the gains. I made up that number for the record, but you can reap most of the gains for a fraction of the effort, right? There's very low cognitive load. You're doing the same thing after every workout. There's no downside. There's a potentially huge upside. And that's as opposed to say, like, imagine in some amazing ideal world, you could actually discover the theoretical optimum of carbohydrate to protein ratio for every single workout. And right, it would be different for every single workout and different for every single day, depending on the context of what was going on in your life. And even if you could actually titrate it perfectly to that perfect optimal amount after every single workout, oh my gosh, how much extra effort is that? And really how much <laughs> marginal gain are you going to get from that? Like, is it you know, would that actually be worth it? Yeah. Jonathan. This is why we recommend like when measuring food and going through that, doing it occasionally, but not, you know, if it's causing so much stress, having to measure everything all the time and, and running that, that can defeat a lot of the purposes that you're really going for, which is make yourself an athlete that can respond better to training. Right. It can be, it can be pretty tough if it overwhelms you. Nate, Alex I Wild. see you smiling. Like you have a cheeky thing to say. <laughs> Alex Wilde just opened a spreadsheet. And he's yeah. like, hmm, I can figure this out. Like, let's get this for in sure. here. <laughs> and that's just the thing. For some people, it's it's it's, it's all fun. part of the process and it's fun and yeah. it's mm -hmm. and it's a positive thing for them. And for others, it's not. So it's really important that you like recognize where you're at on that. What one thing cool. that I've done with this, sorry, uh, Nate, again. Sorry. Oh, I'm just gonna say uh for 99.99% of people is a bad idea. There's a certain personality where getting the exact like not even if it's right just trying to figure it out is extremely fun and mm -hmm. if you're not getting an extreme fun out of it like oh this is really fun to make this spreadsheet and do all these things don't don't try to do it because it's more harm than good to what amber's yes. point is a part of this too is i think finding something that you enjoy like you mentioned amber like the taste of the drink can be like a good signal and one that you enjoy and i actually kind of want to take a quick interlude here and just have each one of us share if we have, whether it's a recovery drink or recovery meal that we really prefer, like the one that we, we go to, if we could, um, I, I, oftentimes my training is just before dinner. So I usually end up going right into dinner and, uh, but recently I've actually changed it up and I've been drinking the recovery drink, then get the having dinner thereafter. Um, the recovery drink that I have landed on, it's one that I've tried a bunch of different ones and I've come back to this one. It's just the basic cliff recovery chocolate one. It's just delicious. I, I, I love it. It tastes like a chocolate drink and I'm okay with giving myself a full chocolate drink rather than going for something that is, I guess, technically trying to find a minimum effective dose with carbs and doesn't taste as good. So, um, but that's like my go-to is cliff's recovery one. Pete, uh, what do you have? <laughs> Um, I'm in this strange, I, uh, I've been doing non-dairy proteins for a while. And so trying to find the best one that I like and enjoy and makes me feel like I'm rewarding myself at the end. Just like you said, like there's something to be said for doing a lot of work and then giving yourself a reward. It makes me very happy. So, mm -hmm. um, I've been trying a lot of different ones and I pretty much always add maple syrup and some sort of milk to it to get the mm -hmm. ratio correct. And once you start drinking maple syrup, man, like 
Life is better for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Ted King has entered the chat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Canadians are like, duh. That's why we're so yeah. happy. Nice. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Amber? Do you have one? I'm sure you've had to drink a lot of sponsored products and stuff over the years, but. Yeah, actually. So um, the one that I, I really like is Plain Way with lemon lime Gatorade powder. And it's it's cheap and easy and it tastes like key lime pie. I really like that. But I will say that like there are a lot of awesome products on the market and I've tried a whole bunch of them. And frankly, like I don't stress too much about the ratio. If I'm making it for myself, I use a four to one ratio, but if I'm sponsored and I'm getting a tasty recovery drink, by the way, I love the cliff chocolate. recovery. It's drink. just good. It's so it tastes good. like a chocolate milkshake. It's good. It's yeah. so good. But yeah, yeah, like as long as it's something that is palatable, it tastes good. The palatability is really important because again, consistency <laughs> is key. So as long as it's something that you really enjoy and that's not going to be upsetting your system. Um, and you can kind of think about recovery drinks like saddles. There are so many different ones out there that if the one that you're trying is giving you GI distress, try something else because I guarantee there's something out there that's going to work for you something that's going to taste good it's going to sit well on your stomach and it's going to make you feel great so um mm -hmm. yeah try a bunch of different stuff how about you Nate um I make well I don't make my own I prescribe my own we talked I talked on Instagram a little about the four quadrants of the getting things done um in my role I'm lucky that I have an assistant and making a whole bunch of drinks would be one of those things where it is work and it feels like you're getting things done but it's not uh the most impactful thing I can do. So I have prescribed stuff and I have a little fridge that's right next to my bike that has recovery drinks and all my drinks ready for me. And that's a thing is like, I think you're more likely to do, to drink your recovery drink if you have it ready before you're done working out. And it's, it's like, it's just right there. So what I do is I have a hundred grams of maltodextrin. I just bought on Amazon which is super cheap. It's like $5 for 20 pounds or something like that. Or no, 10, it's, I don't know. It's, it's very inexpensive. Then I have 20 grams of, or 25 grams of whey optimum nutrition, like a scoop. And then I put in um, a little bit extra, like bulk supplements, leucine, just to make sure I get enough leucine. Um, this is very important. At, your whey protein probably has enough leucine, but I was like, it's a little bit extra is not gonna hurt. And then uh, I usually throw in some other supplements that have, um, uh, aren't probably, uh, they're not as, <laughs> where are um, we going with this? <laughs> they're, no, they're, no, no, not those kind of supplements. I'm talking about like the, it's, it may or may not improve performance, but I'm just going to try it. Beta al alanine, citrulline maltate. I'm not probably saying you those ones, right? I know they're supposed to be before workouts, but it's in here and little creatines in here too. And so that will then change based on the time of year. I have a separate bottle to get the beta alanine, citrulline maltate in before the workout, but I always forget to do it for some reason and, uh, probably no harm doing it afterwards. And it's just making my pee expensive, but, uh, yeah, so that's, <laughs> it's the, these are really cheap. Just if you just make them yourself with that whey uh, protein. Do you add like yeah. chocolate or something to it? Or is the protein chocolatey flavored? Is that why the it's protein brown? is chocolatey flavored on, on pro whey protein? There's like a bazillion flavors. So whatever you want, they will make. Cool. And for those wondering, uh, Nate, of course, on video, if you're joining us via audio, was showing his recovery drink there on screen. Mm -hmm. So, it's okay, with that out of the way, yeah, <laughs> yes, wow. indeed, it is a bottle. <laughs> so, with that out of the way, because I know that people would have been asking, well, what do you actually take in, uh, Amber? We can probably continue on. Sorry for the interlude there, but no, no, no. Um, I think that's great, and I think uh, an important note to make is it doesn't have to be a drink either. Drinks are easy to get down after a workout, especially a hard one. Um, so that that is kind of like a common way of doing it. But if there's just a, a particular snack that you like that you look forward to that tastes really good, it sits well on your stomach. Really, the important thing is getting that carbohydrate and protein into the system and whether it's four to one or three to one, it doesn't matter that much, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. but again, part of the reason for recommending this, that you do this after every workout is the practicality of it. Mm -hmm. Um, this is just as applicable for a morning workout as it is for an evening one, right? So like we were saying, you might not have six hours after an evening workout to eat carbohydrate and replenish your stores. But if you have a recovery shake right after that workout, boom, You've, you've hit that insurance policy and you know, you've got it. It also applies for double days. So it's a really flexible approach. It's something you can apply consistently, even in, you know, differing changes in training schedule. Um, it's a lot more practical than setting a timer to eat every 30 minutes after your workout for the rest of the day. And again, you're taking advantage of that window to kind of get that insurance and faster replenishment. Um, it's also an easy way to up your protein intake over the course of the whole day. 
is getting that protein in your recovery shake. So if you're trying to hit some, some macro targets, this is a great way to bump up your protein intake on the whole. Um, and on that note, it's really good to meet your overall energy demands, which as we started this conversation by saying is one of the two most important things for getting faster, the training stimulus and your total daily intake in terms of meeting your, your overall energy needs. Um, and lastly, I didn't pull, you know, I didn't dig into the science on this per se, but we have so much anecdotal evidence on this, that having a recovery shake at the end of your workout helps to stabilize appetite and mood in the, very, in the many hours after your workout. And all of that goes to enhancing the consistency, not only of uh, the consistency of your training. Cause if you feel good in the hours after your workout, as opposed to just feeling completely destroyed, you're going to be so much more likely to get back on the bike again, en enthusiastically for your workout the next day. Um, so yeah. I think that those are some important points to keep in mind. Pete and I have mentioned too? this before on long rides, we get done and like, Pete and I are like, oh my gosh, like, like, what can we eat now? Like the fridge does not have enough food in it. Give me <laughs> everything, it, right? Give me everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, and it, it does work really well. Having that shake helps a lot so that if you have that shake and then for some reason you have to wait until like the next meal, anything else like that, it just stops you from grabbing the junky food. That's going to fill some sort of a, a, a needless void in that moment when really you could have that and then feed with more nutritious food once it's ready, you know, something like that. So it's, it's a yeah. huge like health tip as well, for sure. Totally. And speaking of health, I have one more point to make on this, which is that immune function is another piece of this puzzle. So as it happens, uh, if you get sick less often, you're probably going to make more gains, right? Because <laughs> Jonathan, you just experienced this getting sick. <laughs> really sets you back. And if you can just avoid getting sick or get sick less frequently, that's a huge bonus in terms of performance and getting faster. Not only does, and not to mention that it's just a nicer way of going about your life. Um, carbohydrate intake during exercise is immunoprotective. It decreases muscle protein breakdown and it decreases cytokine production, which enhances your, your inflammatory recovery in the hours afterwards. Protein and carbohydrate together post-exercise decrease cortisol, which is also immunoprotective. And carbohydrate in particular post-exercise may help restore the immune system after high intensity or strenuous exercise. And in this case, high intensity was defined as basically anything sweet spot or higher. So if you're doing interval work on the trainer, that's high intensity work. And having carbohydrate during and after and some protein after is immunoprotective. So this is a good thing, not only for performance, but the authors are quick to point out that this is particularly relevant right now since we're in the middle of a global <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> so yet another thing to consider in terms of the benefits of carbohydrate during and after training. So that's like a ton of, of, of solid science-based evidence that leads us toward why we want to take in carbs during our workouts and after our workouts and that doing one or the other doesn't cancel out the other one. Mm -hmm. Um, and this probably, so with all that justification in place, it brings us back to the point of finding that minimum effective dose with carbohydrate and our addiction to doing right. that. Now, hopefully with all of that, you can see how silly it is to do that. It's like, you're just trying to run a razor's edge that really has very, but like the asymmetric risk, it's uh, pretty obvious to see. Um, Nate, do you want, do you want to cover some of that? Cause I know this, this yeah. is something that grinds my gears. Yes. It grinds your gears. Exactly. <laughs> and actually somebody um, for, for what it's worth, somebody is in the YouTube chat thanking Nate right now, because they responded to Nate's call to take in more carbohydrate when you're training when a recent podcast, he mentioned that now he can take in 80 grams of carbs and he feels amazing when he trains. So, uh, it's cool. Uh, so faster. thanks for, yes. Yes. So thanks for joining us in the YouTube chat. You can do that every week. Um, but then on top of that, it, it does work. Um, so let's talk about it. Nate. Yeah. And so I think over time, there has been different uh, uh, trends in fitness and in health that are usually brought on by um, usually books or something. And what they talk about is they describe a single mechanism or a mechanism inside the body. And because the mechanism works that way, they extrapolate a result. And in general, in um, science, if you find that you can um, measure the, like the result. So like weight loss, body composition, fitness, and it does not match up with the mechanism. 
that means there is probably something else that's going on that we're not aware of yet, to Amber's point earlier. It's very hard to figure this stuff out. Like we can go, we're probably gonna get to Mars before we figure out everything that's in our bodies. Like I'm, I'm <laughs> positive about that, which is insane to think. <laughs> so if the mechanism <laughs> doesn't match crazy. out with the outcome, true. don't say the outcome is wrong. Say we don't know enough about the human body to understand it. And uh, outcome is fantastic, but mechanism is also fantastic too, because once you understand more mechanisms, you can design more studies, do more research that are more targeted and more insightful. And then you can kind of validate these things. Like, uh, you know, all the, the recent vaccine stuff, there's been the mRNA advances are, that's all done based on how we know the body works. And that has then helped us develop a more effective vaccine for COVID, apparently. Um, like I say, apparently, because it's uh, the efficacy and I'm just, this is sure. scientific talk, right? Allegedly. Uh, yep. Not, not allegedly. Um, <laughs> that's the wrong word. But it's uh, based on the data we have, it's 90 plus percent effective, right? So uh, the two ones with mRNA. But just in general, I think this is a, people will argue, they say, hey, that, that outcome is impossible because of this mechanism. And we're like, but we've measured the outcome. Like attack that the, the outcome was not measured correctly. Don't say the outcome is impossible because of this, this mechanism. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Um, and oftentimes people will try to say that the outcome is wrong by throwing really like they'll do like the Krebs cycle and be like, because of the Krebs cycle, blah, blah, blah. And it's very complex. And everyone else is like, well, I can't argue against that. Cause that person sounds like they've read a lot of books, but you can just kind of, you know, do some gravity tests. Oh, that, gravity is a great example. Well, then we'll learn more. So we've, we've observed Newtonian physics for many, many years. And then as we get into other observations, we're like, Ooh, when we get down to like electrons, they don't pres they don't behave the same way. And we have to come with a whole nother explanation. Our old explanation of how we thought it was is wrong. And this will continually happen in, in, uh, inside of training and nutrition. And that's just the process of science. So expect that and be proud of that. Don't say that uh, it's, that's what you want out of it. I'm kind of rambling here, but Amber, why don't you say something intelligent? Because I think you've got a tweet to read. <laughs> we need to hear from Pete. We need, yeah. we need to bounce this back to Pete. <laughs> no, I what what Nate is really saying is is I it's my favorite thing. I and I say it all the time is nutrition. It's it we don't understand enough, so it's always going to change. What we know now doesn't necessarily hold true. It didn't hold true in the past, and it doesn't necessarily hold true in the future. Um, but <clears throat> one of my favorite things about this topic specifically is. Um, when, in my experience with other athletes, cyclists and other sports, if you aren't someone who religiously takes a recovery meal, beverage, whatever, I guarantee that changing that one single thing will have such a monstrous change in the way that you feel and are able to do what you set out to do. It will, it will, it feels like something there's another force in the universe that's helping you get through your workouts. Um, <laughs> so true. It's, it's un, it's mind blowing. And so if you're one of the people who feel like I'm not working out enough to deserve this, there's no deserve there's you're doing something and put, put something back in your body so that you're capable of doing it again the next time. And I've seen this across brand new cyclists. I've seen it across very experienced cyclists that, for some reason, they just don't think they deserve is usually the word I hear recovery. Mm -hmm. And once that changes there, some of the fastest people I know got even faster. Some of the people who I knew were not, not making the gains they thought they could make as soon as they changed that they've transformed into a different type of an athlete. And it's because you are just fueling and then signaling. Those are the two things that this kind of all goes back to if you fuel your day, if you fuel, fuel your workout and you recover with something that signals your body to like reap the rewards of the work you just did, this is, that's it. That's all we did. And mm -hmm. it was a lot to do that. But once you change your body to kind of accept all that, you turn into a completely different athlete. And I think that's, what's crazy about all of this. You've mm -hmm. just triggered Amber. Whenever you say, <laughs> I don't deserve this. Like, I think that's a trigger for Amber, right? Yeah, big time, <laughs> big time. It's, Don't do that to yourself. 
it's still true, right? And, and yeah. I think I think we can fix that. Like you've done something and you have to put it back in your body to change your body to be more ready for more work and to be stronger the next time. That's all you're doing. Yeah. Give your body what it needs to do what you're asking of it. It's not rocket science. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And we get out of our own body's way, right? Like just, yeah. just let it, yeah, let it have what it I know. needs. Our bodies are amazing and we hold them, like we ask so much of them and we take them for granted. And then, you know, we act like taking in food is something that has to be earned. I mean, your body just, your body keeps you alive every single day. It's kept you alive your whole freaking life. I mean, your body makes it so you don't have to think about contracting your heart muscle muscle every time you need to. I mean, just that one thing alone is pretty astonishing. Um, and then you start to dig into it a little bit deeper and it's just mind blowing and your body's amazing and it deserves nourishment. So just, yeah, yeah let's not be silly about this. We should probably end this, uh, this question here with, uh, some, uh, this is actually a tweet, a series of tweets by Inigo San Milan. Um, he's a sports researcher who was also a previous, he was a pro cyclist as well. Um, and, uh, Amber, you put this tweet in here. Do you want to read it? Cause I think that it's, it's good because a lot of the, we see studies that apply to sedentary people when they're talking about, you know, American, uh, the standard American diet. And we see all this stuff. And a lot of the time we extrapolate it across to us athletes. And we assume that everybody above us is doing something that is involving more deprivation, more something else. And they're just somehow managing to make it work. I like this tweet for, for that reason. Do you want to read that, Amber? Yeah. So uh, to follow on what you said, I think a lot of people who are listening to this, you're exercising regularly. You might even be working out every single day and you might still feel reluctant to refer to yourself as an athlete. So when we talk about athletes, you might kind of automatically count yourself out of this group that we're referring to. But again, like I said, this is, this is about, you know, healthy exercising adults. So if you're a healthy exercising adult, you by our definition are an athlete. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that because people tend to see themselves as, you know, average, then when they read studies or read articles that are talking about kind of the average sedentary lifestyle, they lump themselves into that category because it feels a little bit too arrogant to call yourself an athlete and exceptional from that group. But the truth is if you're exercising regularly, you're not, you're not living in a sedentary lifestyle. So a lot of these things don't actually apply to you again in the absence of metabolic disorder. So these tweets by Inigo San Milan, I thought were really, um, really wonderful. So <clears throat> he was, this was in context with a Twitter thread that he initiated by lamenting, uh, just missing these chocolate paninis that he used to have as a kid. And he said, let's see, I'll, I'll read that there's two from October 20th and then there's one from December 1st. So the two from October 20th go like this. Processed carbohydrate are probably not good, but in my modest opinion, lack of physical activity or very little is the primary problem. Elite athletes have the highest carbohydrate diet, including processed carbohydrate, and yet don't have obesity acquired type two diabetes or cardiovascular disease. Their mitochondria are amazing. He also says, all I'm trying to say is that carbohydrates and wonderful chocolate <laughs> are not responsible for the obesity epidemic. And in, in my opinion, and that's him speaking, sedentarism is the primary problem causing mitochondrial dysfunction and inability to oxidize carbohydrate properly. The secondary problem comes from adding carbohydrate when it can't be metabolized. So if you're training regularly, your body needs this fuel. And this is it. It's for all the reasons we just outlined, it's going to be a good thing. And then the third tweet he has is on December 1st. Um, he says, there's no evidence that carbohydrate restriction works in terms of athletic performance. We were doing it already over 30 years ago when I raced. In fact, I've never seen an athlete be successful restricting carbohydrate. In fact, I've seen too many careers destroyed by it. And, I, and I'm tired of this. We must end this trend. And I think, again, there are so many reasons that carbohydrate gets vilified in mainstream internet <laughs> feeds, mm -hmm. but it's really, really important to examine the context around those claims and really think about how those, how that context applies to you as an individual. We just solved the carb debate right there. <laughs> Gavel struck. It's done. <laughs> I'm sure the internet will all agree. So, um, that was awesome. Thank you, Amber, for going over all of that to recap, uh, carbohydrate intake is, is what your body needs in particular, because you're an athlete, uh, give yourself credit for that hard work that you do. You are an athlete. So you are not an average yeah. person. I want to say just one more comment on that. 
you might say, hey, I'm two to 2.5 watts per kilo. You know, I'm not these huge numbers. You compared to the average American, my goodness, have you seen the average American? <laughs> like yeah. there's other countries too. I'm looking at you, UK and Australia, all of us, <laughs> like we're not very, uh, the, the average person you are at a such different, you're on Mars, right? Compared to the average person. Yes. So don't, you should be so proud of yourself and that you are, uh, and you should not lump yourself in to the person that you see at Walmart, right? right. They're completely different people. Uh, Hey, and I shop just, at Walmart. Same. <laughs> I do too. But the, vast, uh, the average American. We know what you mean, though. Yeah, yeah we know what you to, mean. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Problem, I'm just saying that's a great place to see some Americans is at Walmart. Because sure. Americans go to Walmart. Sure. sure. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. So, so give yourself credit. Taking in carbohydrate during your workout doesn't mean you don't need it after. Taking it in after doesn't mean you don't need it during. Taking it in before doesn't mean you don't need it during. It all has a point and a purpose, and it all has its own unique advantages depending on the different states that you're in. So let's eat carbs and get fast. Um, rapid fire section. <laughs> Jeremy says, and this is the most crucial question of the podcast. We should have started off with this in the beginning. I need, in all caps, need Pete's take on the new Spico Aero Bars. So uh, for those that don't know what those are, I'm not sure that we are actually able to screen share this week, um, uh, but they're, Pete, can you explain these things and explain your take? Because as soon as I saw these, you, I thought of you instantly. <laughs> so <clears throat> they're, they've effectively kind of glued together time trial bars onto- and the bars and glue, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that, that's not what it is. They're they're uh, custom they're custom made carbon fiber handlebars for per person, and more or less what they are trying to do is get you into a more narrow position with forearm rests on your hoods, and they have some very shallow drops, and they also have most of their length in the hood kind of area, and so the stem is very short, um, and so the idea being is they've kind of split the difference between TT bars and being on your hoods is how I've, how I've been thinking about it when I've been riding lately. And <clears throat> they look kind of awesome. I'll, I'll say it. <laughs> uh, they are absolutely terrifying to me because think about every time you stay in your TT bars through a turn and your chances of success are like, I feel like they're 5% or 10%. Like I'm going to, I'm going to stay in the, in the TT bars, but I'm going to crash. So <laughs> I'll just do it. And this, this really compromise, it has to compromise handling for aerodynamics and Nate's but, all about that. No, no. <laughs> See the nice thing about this. So the, the, the hood length is the length of your forearm. And then they yes. take away all the stem length for, in order for this to work. And it's not going to work for all people on all bikes, but Pete, so like, if you're a riding, you know, you see the typical Tour de France rider, they drop their elbows. They're not in the drops, but they're actually keeping their forearms parallel to the mm -hmm. ground, like level. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. faster for most people. You get a smaller frontal area. But Pete, on those turns, what you do, because your hands still are on the brake levers and on the hoods, you just straighten them. You go through the turn and you drop right back in. Uh, mm -hmm. into the, uh, the arrow position. So I don't, I wouldn't recommend going in with your, like, just like regular road riders, they don't usually right. turn with their, uh, elbows dropped on road bars. The same thing here. I think it just does is it supports you. I find in this position for myself, it is extremely fatiguing and I cannot stay in this position at all. Uh, but these bars, uh, one thing is they're very narrow, right? Pete, how are they 36? I think they're even narrow. I think they're 30, somewhere between 30 and 36, uh, but they, that is so narrow. That's two thirds the width of my bar. <laughs> You'd be, it would be very, very narrow. Think of all yeah, the yeah. holes you could uh, squeeze into though in a crib. I, I did think about that. Uh, <laughs> and what I'm, what I'm thinking the benefit is, is long, relatively straight road stages where you're spending most of your time and energy going on one direction. I can't say, since I haven't ridden them, maybe they handle amazingly, maybe they don't but I probably wouldn't ride them in something that's ultra technical where I'm not spending a bunch of sustained time in my flat forearmed arrow position. 
people so um if pete shows ahead, up Amber. with these things you know what he's planning to do <laughs> yeah, yeah that's a, that, yes that's a good point <laughs> if somebody has these bars it's like yeah okay that guy's gonna be in a breakaway it's like so clear <laughs> it's like when they show up and they have like a skin suit and like arrows tall socks and everything else like yeah you're not gonna sprint like <laughs> that guy's not planning it, on right? a sprint yeah exactly no. <laughs> um i i think i know everyone loves wide for gravel i hate wide for gravel but on a gravel race these would be pretty dope because you could st- you don't have to have the uh, arrow bars on it, but when you're alone for two hours, right, by yourself, you could drop in, be more arrow, and go. The, it's only, a, I think it could be hard, uh, if you're not used to the narrowness, it could get really uh, tiring on parts of your body, but I, w- I would love to try this. I'm calling it out right now, a friend of the podcast, Jeff Kabush, this is how you're going to get around the arrow bar thing, aren't you? Like, you're going to use these, they're not technically arrow bars, so you're going to be able to sneak your way right through. Um, it's a but whole they're, new controversy. Are, yeah, it's a whole different thing. They are wild looking. They're crazy. You can check them out on Cycling Tips. has an article all about them. They're wildly expensive. Aren't they like 1,500 US or something like that? It's just- uh, 1,500 euros. Oh my gosh. So very expensive, uh, but they're, you know what? I'm all for it though. Let's change up some of the standard stuff that we have with bikes. I, you know, we should change it mm-hmm. up. So- uh, okay. And while we're covering extremely important questions, tan wall tires, yay or nay, this one's from Alexi. Uh, on both mountain and road. Yes. All tires Ooh. should be tan walls. <laughs> Whoa. That's a bold stance. Amber. <laughs> I like the tan walls. Yeah. I would say yay. Nate. Yeah. Either one black or tan. They both look good. Just don't go black and tan. Mm-hmm. That's weird. We have about nine Got minutes left, so use, so use all nine to express my persnickety opinions on this. Um, but <laughs> no, I think I think that it absolutely depends on the bike. Like if you have green on your bike, tan wall tires can look very wrong. I'm just gonna dip in my personal <laughs> opinion. So I know very strange. What, just what color green? Now, if you've got like British racing green, we're in an entirely different place. See? That's great. Please oh, use wow. the tan walls. But you see, your umbrella ooh. statements are just I, you know. You can't say that thing. <laughs> oh, I, we can go for hours on this feet. <laughs> How many shades of green are there? There are many. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm all for them. The only problem is that in a lot of cases, the best tires or the, you don't have the best selection of tires in tan wall. So that you have w- with black, uh, on the other side. So anyways, glad we solved those big questions. Uh, Tyler says, please put this one in the rapid fire section. What are your favorites in each category? Favorite gel. Uh, mm. Martin for me, I, so, not yes. because it tastes great. It just works. I like untapped maple. Ooh, it's the taste. I'm a, I'm a Boston cream cliff? high cliff. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I know what you're going to say. Cliff. <laughs> yeah. He, sh- <laughs> he shared, he had like a whole, I think he had a whole fanny pack full of Boston cream pie ones when we were up in Oregon this year, sharing them with everybody. Pete's like the yeah. best cliff ambassador ever. <laughs> yeah, I know he does. He gives, he brings extra snacks. If you're right with Pete in a fanny pack. He always it's brings amazing. extra. And he, hands so them. he doesn't even ask. You don't even have to ask. He like opens it and gives it to you. So like, you're like, I don't want this to go to waste. <laughs> my my wife I... was like close to bonking and she just like kept taking, she didn't even ask. Pete just kept giving her gels whenever we stopped every <laughs> single time. Kept her alive. It was great. Uh, favorite block or chew? I would go cliff a... on that. Uh, oh yeah. Cliff watermelon chews. My favorite. Yeah. Salt, salted watermelon. Salt. Salted watermelon for me too. Cliff salted or uh, I love honey stinger waffle, the pink lemonade chews. Ooh, yeah, those are good too. They're kind of like uh, tangy almost. They have a zing to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, favorite bar? I assume when riding. The Rice Krispie thing. Treats. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Overruled. Whatever I had in my head before, <laughs> overruled. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You might, you're gonna have uh i'm i like the coffee um cliff bars for ride food ride bars for sure i don't do any bars I've, i just don't they don't do well with me when i ride but it's hard to eat did you see on my instagram my my wife bought my kids like giant sheets of rice krispie bars and you like cut them yes. out and you do decorations um that's it i, I want to pull up with one of those with the chat because chad won't listen to this podcast <laughs> then <laughs> that out be like here's my nutrition and like keep it around my body uh, <laughs> like pads rice crispy yeah. pads like <laughs> for those who don't know like 80 percent of the stuff i do is just trolling chad 
Like, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite thing in life. And he doesn't realize it. <laughs> it's the truth. Actually, I take it back. My favorite one is the Cliff Bar with Katarina Nash on it. Not because oh, of yeah. the flavor, but mm-hmm. Katarina is my hero and she's just she awesome. So awesome. it's cool that she has her own Cliff Bar. Um, and I always like taking pictures of it whenever we go somewhere and I send them to her and I'm like, ask her how she's enjoying the trip wherever we're, we're at. So <laughs> it's a good fun thing. You should tag Katarina in whichever ones you have with the, um, oh gosh, what flavor is it? It's, um, it's banana nut, banana nut. Um, uh, yeah. So w- please take pictures of Katarina and where it's you're like taking her on your adventures. Flat Stanley, but with Katarina. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> flat Stanley. Exactly. What's in my mind. All right. Favorite mid ride gas station snack. Glazed donut. Ooh, I'm, I'm a donutter too. Uh, mm-hmm. as soon as, as soon as I'm pedaling my bicycle, a donut is absolutely something I want in addition to <laughs> regular life too. <laughs> Nate, um, ice cold Coca-Cola and a sleeve of crumb donuts. You know, there's that Ooh. like little Coca-Cola. Debbie sleeve yeah. of crumb donuts. Coconut. Those are good. Yeah. yeah. Those are mine. Yeah, the coconut crumb thingies. Yeah. Yep. Coconut crumb, little Debbie donuts. They're the number mm-hmm. one. And then Haritos or Haritos, however you want to say it. But mm-hmm. uh, lo- the lime soda, it just tastes like lime jello. It's incredible. <laughs> it's the best. So, and it's like buckets of sugar. So, okay. And then last thing, and this is a quote favorite I just did a massive ride and need to eat Jonathan's weight and whatever I want food. <laughs> 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 so that's like the fridge raid, right? <clears throat> uh, my favorite is just oh. a giant burrito with a ton of horchata. Mm-hmm. I'm a burrito or Bur- mm-hmm. it's so it's so convenient. You can just so. inhale like 1200 calories just like that. Mm-hmm. Nate on carne asada burrito. Zero <laughs> question. I do burritos like every day. So I feel I don't know. Mm. I, I obviously is Popeyes. The Popeyes uh, with fries, I was the waiting for it. or uh, a hamburger and fries, but f- fries are the key part of that. And Popeyes mm. has excellent fries, mm. but I won't, I think I've done, someone got mad at me because I would say done instead of eat. That's just a thing I say, because uh, they thought I had an unhealthy relationship, but I've, I've had Popeyes <laughs> once in the last year, but it was after a, like a mm, 70 mile mountain bike race. And it was great. Yeah. And I like, I chatted to like Keegan and Ryan and Jonathan and I showed pictures and I described it and it was delicious. <laughs> and we were all happy for you. We, we, we reacted with love emojis on all of it. Yeah. So, um, it's your award. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta let yourself have that. It's, it's awesome. So, okay. We're going to cover one more question then we'll be done, uh, for the, for this episode. And this one's from Ethan and it's about how to bounce back from overtraining. <clears throat> so Ethan says, I recently discovered your podcast and love it listening. I feel like I'm in a cycling cafe with a group of seasoned pros who have invited me to sit at their table. Like, this is awesome. That's very really cool. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not the seasoned. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, so it must be and Nate and Jonathan over here. Yeah. Um, Cool. He says, I'm 54 and have been riding for fun and friendly competition for years, usually picking a half dozen events to train for and doing my best at. Historically, my training has been fairly on point and I can normally count on finishing in the top third in any event. Way to go. Uh, He says, in 2020, with all events being canceled, I went off my schedule and rode as often as I could for as many hours as I had time for, always solo. Unfortunately, I burned out horribly in May and exhausted with heavy legs and frequently lightheaded. I took all of June off. I even had my doctor run a battery of tests on me, but she found I was in fantastic health despite not feeling like it. After my break, I was back at full strength in July and August, but waned a bit. And he says again by October. Since then, I've accepted I seriously overtrained and keep taking recovery weeks. But seems like he says, but it seems like a week off has me feeling invincible for a few days then I'm exhausted again. So my question for you, how does an aging warrior in his fifties bounce back from overtraining without a soul and without a soul and fitness crushing winter off the bike? <clears throat> Forgive me for breaking up the cadence there. He says, and how might the same guy return to training hard next year without facing overtraining again? I have peers well o- older than me who are still going strong and I'm not ready to hang my bike up yet. Uh, so thank you. So his question is how to bounce back from overtraining with the asterisk on that being as an aging athlete in his fifties, rather than uh, a young twenties, something or something else, when you could do whatever you wanted seemingly, and then wake up the next day and (laughs) be a peak performance. Uh, so Pete, I kind of want to hand it to you on this one first. Um, what, what do you, what would you want to tell him in this case, how to bounce back from overtraining? 
Um, I think one of the things we talked about a lot is if you're if you're really trying to fill a time a, an, a, an exact amount of time in your life with only cycling, you will not be doing what you are supposed to be doing. And we've seen it happen. I've seen it happen countless times over the years where if you have four hours to spare every third day, you just fill it every minute of it with cycling. And that's your check mark. You're like, I filled my spare time with cycling. And what you'll do is you can really kind of grind yourself down without noticing it because you're not holding yourself accountable day after day after day. Um, and generally speaking, all of the workouts you're doing should be like a nice reminder of how you should be feeling like a workout should make you feel a specific way and you should be uh, focusing on how that feels. And then the next time and the next time and the next time, and you'll be able to tell really quickly if you're on a downward trajectory or maintaining or getting faster when you're just filling your time with riding, which is very easy to do. And I, I know many of us would choose to do that if we could. Um, you can't kind of keep your fingers on the pulse the same way. And so you kind of have to remove the success of your cycling with filling the time and more with you're trying to do specific things with your time in cycling and how to do those things. And I think that's the first thing we got to break apart. Um, and once you're there, then you can start unwinding all the other things that are going on with the with the training and the overtraining and all that. But if you don't fix the first thing, you'll, the, the rest of what you do probably won't matter. That's how, that's how I'm thinking of this question. I know Amber, you had some notes too. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, I think that, yeah, well, first of all, with overtraining, when you, when you overdo it, it can take a really, really long time to recover from this. I, I got severely overtrained myself and it probably, I felt a lot better over the course of months, but it really wasn't until a year or two later that I actually realized that I felt back to my normal self. So it's really, really good. First of all, that you're noticing this and that you're doing something about it. So huge kudos to you right off the bat. Um, the other thing I just want to mention about the, the doctors telling you like, Oh, you, you're perfectly healthy. Um, just because your say blood test results fall within reference ranges doesn't mean the most important thing is how you're feeling. If you know that you're feeling off, something is off. And if it's not showing up in your blood work, okay. But it doesn't mean that you're fine. If you don't feel fine, you're not fine. Right. So, so trust your intuition, trust your body. Um, and, and I would encourage you to try to work with your doctor a little bit to, to dig more deeply into the symptoms that you're feeling, even if they're not like really, even if they're nebulous symptoms and they're really qualitative and it's really hard to pinpoint what's going on. Um, I'll give an example. My family, we have familiar, familial thyroid problems. So I've been hypothyroid my whole life. It's just a familial thing. It's not a big deal. Um, but it's something that I kind of have to titrate with my doctor and, and figure out how, uh, my supplement is going to, is going to affect me. And one of my, one of the best doctors I ever worked with that she said exactly this, if you're not feeling right, just because you're within the right reference range, doesn't mean that this is optimally working for you. So let's, let's work on moving you within that range and see if we can get a better outcome in terms of how your symptoms are feeling. So trust yourself. You're doing a great thing by taking the time to actually address this now. Um, and be patient with yourself. And then the other thing I would say is focus on some other kind of ancillary things around the training, because I know that it's hard to say, just stop training because you're overtrained because it's, it's an, it's a mental and emotional outlet as much as it is, as it is physical. And that can be really helpful in the healing process too. So you don't necessarily want to rob yourself of that, but you definitely need to dial it back. Dialing back on the volume is going to be really helpful. Um, dialing back probably on the intensity as well, but you can also focus on some self-care type activities that will help your training like mobility work. I think that that's a really good one. You can focus big time on that. It feels like you're taking care of yourself. And then when your body is healed and you're back to, you're, you're able to start taking on a higher load of, of training on the bike, you're going to be in a really, really good position to be able to handle that kind of work. And especially at the older we get, the the more we're going to gain from doing mobility work. So I, I think that that's just kind of like a no brainer, um, thing that you can get into. That's not going to be detrimental and, uh, it can help focus your mind and still be a little bit of an outlet. Mm -hmm. Nate, you yeah. recently even went through a bout of this. Yeah. yeah. Ethan, you are doing too much volume. Simple <laughs> as that. And you're trying to come back and like, what can I do to solve to do too much volume again in the future? Um, 
you have to do less volume. It might be for the rest of your life. It might be for six months. It might be for a year or two. Volume and intensity, I would reduce that. Um, here, here, I just want to give you some ideas of what to do, and then I'll tell you about my experience. One is more rest between hard workouts. You're saying like every, every you know, I come to full strength, and then after a couple days, I, I, I you know, I, I feel exhausted again. Well, I would maybe do, if you do one intense workout, either the next day have completely off or do a light aerobic ride and then have a complete day off. So every like third day have a complete day off. If that's not enough, have it every other day be a complete day off. And then if that's not enough, reduce the intensity of the rides to be aerobic in nature until you start feeling better again. Uh, based on everything you heard in this podcast before, totally look at those uh, recovery drinks and carb intake. The amount you will recover when your carb take intake improves is insane. Um, I don't, I don't, if you're trying, if you're also trying to and just calorie restriction in general, every time where I have imploded, I try to like, I am getting so fast. And then I'm like, well, what if, what if I like <laughs> just <laughs> lower my, what if I lost two more pounds? I did it while John was talking. Like I'm 192 right now. If I was 188, <laughs> I would be 4.2 watts per kilo as fast as John. And I could drop John maybe someday if he has a bad day. And I've never done that on a climb in my life. And I just thought in my life, I was like, what if? And I was like, no, Nate, that is bad. Don't do that. Focus on the watts and the volume. You'll be faster in the long term. And so I would, that's just one thing to think about sleep. Um, how is work? You know, all that, all that sort of stuff. Make sure you're, uh, um, you're feeling it. So, in my experience, when I, I had this, my little implosion, um, I would fail workouts, workouts that I knew I should have been able to do. And I would have this feeling during the day of my heart being light and fast. Like my, my resting heart rate was a lot higher, but also just felt like light. I don't know. It's kind of a weird thing to say, but even while lying in bed, for me, I took a complete week off and then I had four to eight weeks of like 50% reduced volume. I had more rest between hard workouts and I made the super days super easy. Like some of these are, you know, 45% of FTP. So basically like it doesn't even feel, it feels like walking pretty much. Um, and then after that, I had actually a bigger boost in fitness and now I'm trying to, uh, not as much volume as I used to do, but more than I had before. And then I'm going to take more often actually recovery weeks. I just was talking to John about this. I might be trying a two on one off, uh, instead of a three on one off, uh, ratio for myself, because in that third week I'm pretty, uh, fried and I don't need to be extra fried, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm, I might be better doing less overall for the whole year based on I'm getting older too. I'm 38. So yeah, I would, yeah. but in general, you're doing too much, Ethan, like you're, you're telling us you're doing too much. <laughs> I come back and I overtrain. What do I do? <laughs> uh, it seems pretty obvious, right, from the outside, as most things do, uh, right. outside in looking in where it's hard to see it yourself. What everybody's shared here is has been awesome. Once again, redoubling down on the carb discussion too that we had there that can really help. Uh, the only thing that I would add to this at the end is to remember that you are not an athlete and you are not a cyclist because you train today. That's a big thing that we have to break because when we miss a workout. We tell ourselves all sorts of negative things. We have the temptation to, to be like, you're not even a cyclist. You didn't train today. Everybody else trained that you're going to race against. And there's all these negative thoughts that creep in with that. And you have to block that out and you have to break this association that you have with, if I'm not training really hard, if I'm not training a ton, if I'm not returning completely exhausted, then I'm not a cyclist. You need to break that assumption. In this case, you doing the best thing for your health is actually also the path toward becoming the best cyclist you can be, which is actually the case for all of us. <laughs> so, and, and whichever circumstance we're in. So in this case, Ethan focus, like, I really like what Amber said, focus on mobility work maybe some strength work, focus on, on maybe it's when you're on the bike, you just work on skills. I don't know. Like you work on something different that finds more fun into the sport of cycling as well. I don't mountain biking, cyclocross gravel, something different. I don't know, but don't associate time off with you not being an athlete time off is a part of the athletic process. So as you learn to manage that and include that into your Move forward moving progress, you're going to be in a much better headspace, but then you'll also be healthier as well. So, 
Um, hopefully that was helpful for Ethan and everybody else, uh, that may be coming up against something like that, uh, fuel with carbs, whether it's during or after or before, uh, make sure you're kind to yourself with overtraining. And then if you're a beginner racer, make sure that you, uh, don't ward out stage races. Those are the main takeaways. And of course, tan walls. Um, so, uh, <laughs> thanks everybody for joining uh, us on this week's podcast. Remember you can submit questions at trainerroadcom slash podcast. That would be huge. We'd appreciate that. We get so many questions every week and please keep doing it. We really appreciate it. Even if we can't answer every question. And please share this podcast with other people. Uh, I always talk about this, but if everybody just shared the podcast with one other person, imagine how many more people we could make faster uh, be as a result of that. It'd be great. The world will be a faster place and a fast place is a good place. So thanks everybody. We will talk to you next week. Bye-bye everyone. You have to say goodbye guys. Not just oh, yeah. bye. bye guys. <laughs> bye everybody. <laughs> I'm going to go pee. Bye everyone. <laughs>